Coming up on Windows Weekly, I, Micah Sargent, am subbing in for Leo Laporte, and you know what that means. Thought exercises for Paul Therott and Richard Campbell. We uh, have a conversation with Paul where he says he wants the enterprise experience of Windows as a consumer user, not that consumer user that's filled with all the extra cruft. Then we talk about what Windows 11 got in the latest patch Tuesday, a little about Windows Insider as well, Microsoft's upcoming Surface slash AI event, and Paul giving the custom GPT builder a go. As always, we cover Xbox and Xbox Corner and loads of tips tips and tricks with the back of the book. All of that coming up on Windows Weekly. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Therott, Richard Campbell, and Micah Sargent. Episode 872, recorded Wednesday, March 13th, 2024. Go Skype yourself. This episode of Windows Weekly is brought to you by CashFly. For more than 20 years, CashFly has held a track record for high-performing, ultra-reliable content delivery, serving more than 5,000 companies in more than 80 countries. At Twit.tv, we have been using CashFly for more than a decade, and we love their lag-free video loading, hyper-fast downloads, and friction-free site interactions. CashFly is the only CDN built for throughput. Its ultra-low latency video streaming delivers video Video to more than a million concurrent users. It's got lightning fast gaming that delivers downloads faster with zero lag, glitches, or outages. Mobile content optimization that offers automatic and simple image optimization so your site loads faster on any device, plus flexible month to month billing for as long as you need it, and discounts for fixed terms when you've settled in. You can design your contract when you switch to Cashfly. Cashfly delivers rich media content up to 158% faster than other major CDNs and allows you to shield your site content in their cloud, ensuring a 100% cash hit ratio. And with CashFly's elite managed packages, you will get the VIP treatment. Your dedicated account manager will be with you from day one, ensuring a smooth implementation and reliable 24-7 support when you need it. Learn how you can get your first month free at cashfly.com slash twit. That's C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com slash twit. It's time for Windows Weekly. And if you're listening to this and not watching, you're probably going, what voice is that? Well, maybe you know. It's Micah Sargent subbing in for Leo Laporte, who is on vacation in Mexico. Uh, I am here to join two of the wonderful Windows watchers of the world. It is Paul Therott. Hello, Paul. <laughs> and Richard Campbell. <laughs> Hello, Richard. Hey, Micah. Great to see you. <laughs> Good to see you both. Um, I, you know, I think our listeners are always curious to hear. Uh, Paul, from whence do you hail uh, this week? I'm back home in McCunchy, Pennsylvania after five weeks in Mexico. And um, if I fall asleep in the middle of the podcast, it's not you guys. It's... Um, <laughs> It's me. It's, it's, it's not you, it's me. Uh, understood, yeah. understood. Is it rainy there or snowy there? Or what is the weather like there right no, now? No, it's actually, it's nice for here right now. It's um, sunny and it's actually warm for here. Although as I observed to my wife when we were flying home yesterday, standing in the pitch dark in front of our apartment in Mexico, I said, look at the temperature right now because it's warmer here right now than it's going to be all next week in Pennsylvania. <laughs> you don't even know it's like the middle of the night, but uh, it's for here this time of year, it's good. And how about you, Richard Campbell? Where are you calling from this week? I'm in Studio C of the DevRel Studios at Building 25 on the Microsoft campus. This is uh, MVP week. So there's a whole, yeah. there's a 1,500 or so MVPs descended on the place. And I'm down here for that. And I was able to ask nicely of the right folks to see if I could borrow a studio for a few hours. Nice. nice. It looks... Nice. Um, uh, like a serial killer uh, hotel room or something. Like yeah. that. <laughs> this, this used to be the room with all of like the old versions of windows and things behind it. I yeah, was surprised nice. when I walked in here and it's nothing but, uh, but sound reflection cushions and, yeah. uh, and plastic and sheeting on the floor. A couple of scalpels, <laughs> you know, <laughs> some bleach. <laughs> that's, that's good. That's good. This week on Dexter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, well, 
let us get rolling with the show this week, kicking off mm -hmm. with what's new in Windows 11. Oof. What is it new? Um, is always this is new. not in the notes, <laughs> but uh, I've heard from multiple people and I've seen screenshots of this. Um, the indignities never end for Windows users, unfortunately. They're getting uh, pop-ups advertising Bing, and uh, you can switch your search engine back to Bing. It's easy to switch back, you know, blah, 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 whatever. I would... I. I think I'm going to make it my life's work now to put an end to this nonsense. You know, the constant badgering of use other Microsoft stuff. Um, it's just, it's getting to be too much. You know, I've stopped using OneDrive largely. I've stopped using Microsoft Word largely. I mean, how far are we going to push the user base, you know? Um, and I, I guess there's no end to it. I don't know. I, this is a new era. I almost want, this is so weird and out of sort of our character for me, but I'm reading uh, Steven Snofsky's book, Hardcore hmm. Software, and I've referenced this a few times. You know, I, I have my issues with the man, but I want to talk to him now because I'm curious. He probably can't talk about this. I'm sure that was part of his separation agreement, but um, I'd love to talk to him about what has happened to Windows in his wake and what he thinks of it. You know, I'd love to hear this because he, for all, whatever issues one might have, I mean, he comes from the old school era at Microsoft, right? I mean, yeah. he ran Office for several years and obviously then Windows, but I, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm kind of in broken record mode here now. I just don't know. I don't even know what to say anymore. Like it's it, every day you wake up and there's a new little smack to the face and I don't quite understand why that is. But and this is I, mean, I would also think he, he's from the era where Windows was the center of the company. And that is and where, you know, Microsoft anymore. actually said, uh, what is the customers want? We should do that. Mm. You know, that kind of thing, that that kind of thinking, which um, I don't understand how that ever goes out of vogue. But. And this is all just kind of surrounding the use of the platform as a means of of pitching other well to you. That's where your complaint yeah, is of uh, leaning in and kind of guiding. What do you call it? Like a nudge, nudging users in a certain direction. Except it's not a nudge as so much as it is a push off the edge of the cliff. You know, <laughs> um, you know the forced edge usage, right? In Windows Eleven, that that type of thing. Um, people kind of forget this, I bet. But when Windows Eleven first shipped. They actually got rid of the default browser interface. There was no way to set a default browser. You could go in and individually set individual protocols and things like that. But you, there was no button that said, like, I want this to be the default. And so, of course, they stepped back from that particular cliff. But then they just ignored it because they force you to use Edge in certain circumstances. Unless you're in the EU now with the DMA and all that. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But um there's still just a lot of badgering going on. Um, that is, I, you know, this is the in certification stuff, as we'll call it here mm -hmm. in the family friendly Windows Weekly. Um, uh, you know, when the needs of the company outweigh the needs of its own customers um, and uh, user experiences start turning on you because you're not what's important anymore. I mean, it, it's a it's a strange thing. And I know Windows is not the focus. I, I understand that at Microsoft. Um but it's still responsible for several billion dollars of revenues every quarter. <laughs> you yeah. know, you think they um, take it more seriously than that because the, in general, there is a pretty strong culture at Microsoft of customer data driven features. Yes. But it's yes. almost like, it's almost like they're the lepers. And so nobody's talking to them or telling them what to do. And they're just sort yeah. of running the asylum. Well, you know, I, unless they're listening on the microphone, uh, which they could be right. Hmm. Um, what telemetry data doesn't tell you is uh, how loud the man screams when, <laughs> you know, stuff turns on them, right? Uh, when yeah. the pop-up comes up again, you know, or uh, it's not even just confronting you with things, although that's a big part of the experience, right? Um, anyone who has the um, the will <laughs> to turn off Edge as the default browser will be badged, badgered to use that product for the rest of their lives, right? I mean, that's the thing you have to kind of live with. But then there's the behaviors like OneDrive where... I, I witnessed this multiple times in the past two weeks where, uh, no, I do not want to use this for folder backup. Thank you very much. And then you notice uh, a certain kind of error message that occurs because you're deleting a file and you can say, wait a minute, this, and you go and look and sure enough, they turn it on. Just turn it on. Didn't say anything. Just did it for you. Wow. You know? And it's just, you know, it's a little tough. So anyway, this morning, like I said, I woke up, I think three people had forwarded me a screenshot of their own screenshot of, a new, a new, a, you know, a front in Windows, which is uh, 
selling Bing and the Bing Bing search as you're, you know, changing. And I don't know. It's getting tiring, I guess mm. is what I'm trying to say. So anyway, today's show is going to be about how to switch to Linux. Here we go. <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, no. that's, don't think that's true. No, really coincidentally, don't. I ordered a Mac today. Mm -hmm. uh, completely coincidental. Uh, has nothing to do with anything I just said. But dear God, please make it stop. You mm. said that it mean it makes you use um, Microsoft's Word less. Um, I don't use it at all. Don't use it at <laughs> anymore. All. How yeah. long have you been off of of the Microsoft Word? Of Word since yeah, and what about do you November, use instead? I think. Yeah. So I've gone through a couple of different things. I, I uh, if I'm going to move off of something as long lived as Word, right, which is a difficult decision to make or even like OneDrive, same thing. I mean, I it's built into Windows. It's easy. It works well, you know, for the most part, but the badgering, badgering and then the bad behavior, et cetera. Um, you know, at that point, you start to think a little differently. So in the case of uh, a word replacement, I, what I wanted to use was something that was... Um, I like Markdown. I wanted to use a Markdown editor. I've been using Typora for the most part, which is good. My, I have unique issues. <laughs> and, and of course, you're saying, I, we, we can tell that, Paul. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, uh, you know, compared to normal Windows users in that I use a lot of different computers. So I, as I switch between computers, one of the things I try to do is, um, you know, automate the process of getting up and going and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the problem with Typora is it has a, a limited license for a number of PCs. You can install it on and it deactivates and you can reactivate and you can, but it's a pain. And I, I, I wrote those guys and I was like, hey, look, I've been kind of using your product. I love it. I paid for it. Um, I'm happy to pay more. But what, what I'd like is some kind of a license where I don't have to keep reactivating it. Mm -hmm. And uh, they just told me, well, first of all, they took, it took them almost 10 days to get back to me, but they finally got back to me and said, you know, you could just use it on active. It doesn't matter. Like it works fine. It, you have to just, you know, you have to get rid of a dialogue, which is a pain. And I'm like, guys, that's, that's not an answer. Like I need, you know, so I started looking around and I, I've actually been using uh, Libre LibreOffice uh, writer, which is like their word replacement. This is the, this came up out of star office, which, you know, sun purchased in the nineties. I think we talked about this last week and um, it actually works really well. And it's got this, it's got its own little kind of old school quality to it. Meaning, pre-ribbon Microsoft Office, you know, you can kind of really, you, I mean, you can still use an office, but you can customize the toolbars and what's there and kind of make it more of a minimalist UI, which I really like. And uh, I use it with rich text, not with like a Word or open document format. Um, but it works great. It works surprisingly well, actually. So nice. lately I've been using that. Huh. And what about you, Richard? Are you... <laughs> Uh, I'm not as frustrated as Paul, but you know, few no, people are. Yeah, that's uh, right. I mean, my my current nag is for the MVP summit. You have to, you should fill out a schedule, right? They sort of select what sessions you're going to go to for, and they generate a schedule for you that shows up as a separate live ICS in your Outlook, which is fine. That's not a big deal. It's kind of cool because you can tinker with the scheduler, and then that'll be reflected immediately in your schedule. But I don't think they allocated quite enough resources to it. So every so often, Outlook wasn't able to contact that that schedule to make sure it was up to date. And whenever that would happen, it would pop a modal dialog that said, oh. cannot connect to schedule. Okay. There's there's not a not okay button. Like you don't mm. have that <laughs> not okay. Yeah. <laughs> this not is okay. not okay. <laughs> no. But it stops everything. And it's like, it, this is the thing. It's like, it's not a sin. It's not the MVP folks fault that they didn't perfectly serve the schedule. It's that somebody at Outlook thought, yeah, mode that looks good enough. You know, I'm going to interrupt everything. I'm going to lock Outlook so that you will click the OK button. Jeez. Yeah, that's frustrating. Brutal. Yeah. yeah. Brutal. It's, uh, what is it, death by a thousand cuts kind of mm. situation. And it's this yeah. kind of this thoughtlessness that you run into here, there, and everywhere. There's just a lot of moving parts and I'm, I'm empathetic, but it's like, you would think they would be getting better after this much time. Yeah. Well, speaking of getting better, do you want to talk about <laughs> Windows <laughs> nice 11 segue. now, Paul? <laughs> yes. Yeah, sorry. I didn't mean to go no, off on that, a rant it's, there. It's good. Uh, <laughs> so yesterday was patch Tuesday. Um, we got the expected cumulative updates across the two versions of Windows 11, Windows 10, et cetera. Um, some new features get squeaked in because they do, right? One of the big stories for the past year and a half now, I guess, is that 
you know, Microsoft said, hey, we're going to do this one feature update a year. But then they started updating Windows every month with the new features um, with rare exception. I think maybe December last year, you know, it's it does. We get something every month. Right. And of course, we've got this moment five thing coming soon or coming now, depending on how you're updating your system. So Patch Tuesday brought a couple of features that we've seen tested in the Insider program, like a USB 80 gigabyte per second, 80 gigabit per second support. Um, if you use the phone link app in Windows, you probably may know that if you go into settings, there was a phone area that had a phone link item in it. And there wasn't really anything you could do in there, but it had some links to some stuff. And that's been changed to mobile devices. And I think that they're going to start uh, bulking that part of the settings app up with more things. So that they've kind of set the stage for that as well. Um, I'll just very randomly throw out the fact that Windows 10 actually got some functional updates because I know everybody took Microsoft at their word when they said no new features for Windows 10. And yeah, it's been a roller coaster ever since. This is not big stuff, but if you're familiar with the way that Windows 11 has been being updated lately, including in Moment 5, um, the share interface is getting some uh, explicit app support, which Microsoft is doing, which is kind of strange. In other words, if you were uh, the maker of WhatsApp, for example, you could opt to uh, integrate into this system whenever someone's trying to share something that could be shared through your app. Apparently, they never did that. So Microsoft's adding that stuff manually, right? So WhatsApp, I think Facebook Messenger, a couple of others are popping up in that interface now. And that's happening in Windows 10 too, not just Windows 11. Um, not a big deal and not something that a lot of people would notice, but, you know, it's happening. Um, this was part of, oh, where did they dis disclose this? Maybe it was actually part of the next story when we talk about Windows and the EU and the DMA. But Microsoft recently disclosed that uh, how they were going to roll out what we call Moment 5, although the company has never used that name publicly, but Moment 5 being the latest quarterly feature update to Windows 11 and uh, yeah, no, to Windows 11, uh, all, both versions. So there was a preview release recently. Remember, I think it was last week we talked about how they were going to release it, and it was a little bit late. That was tied to the uh, what we call the week D update set of updates, right, from the previous week. This week was week B, which is Patch Tuesday. Uh, we didn't get the stable version of that, if you will, but it's still available in preview. Um, there will be another release of that in preview in two weeks or a little bit under two weeks. And then the stable version will go out in April. And Microsoft said that they expect it to be fully deployed or reasonably deployed um, by late April mm -hmm. uh, worldwide. So what is it? Uh, yeah, we get about six weeks uh, <laughs> on the schedule where things are going to get a little weird because features will stop pop, you know, start popping up for, uh, for people in different areas at different times. Um, because we're all living in a roulette wheel now and that's how we do things. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, there's no other way to say it. it's just, I'm just, I'm trying to get comfortable with it. It's just, uh, what does Microsoft call it? Continuous innovation. I guess I would call it sporadic updating. I don't know. Mm. Uh, so, okay. Here's, a, here's something that I'm curious about because mm -hmm. part of what you do um, all, both on the show and on your site, yeah. um, yep. is to is to, beat my head against the wall. Yeah, <laughs> no, is to talk about <laughs> yeah. is to talk yeah. about what's new on these platforms and right. what the, the struggle that I have as a uh, consumer tech journalist who primarily covers Apple is yeah. that Apple does far fewer updates throughout the year. And so you got to find stuff to talk about the rest of the time. Ah, and well, here, let, uh, so uh, before you continue, I'm sorry, to not sorry to interrupt, but uh, from my point of view on the outside of your world, mm -hmm. I look at the Apple world as a never ending series of, you know, forget about the iPhone 16, wait until the iPhone 17 comes out a year after that. <laughs> like it's, uh, there's a lot of rumors. Yes, that's, you true. Know, in, that's in, true. In the Apple space. That's, uh, but then again, I'm also kind of jealous. I was, I, I, it's funny you, started down this path. I was, I, I have a rough idea of how this works, but I was, I was going to ask you, you know, what your view is of how Apple updates its platforms, but also just express a bit of jealousy as to the, the Mac to me, seems like it's on a more stable, predictable update path mm -hmm. than windows. Well, no, not just to me. It is right. It, 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 this it is actually, an objective yeah. fact, right? But you're saying from the perspective of a, 
like a tech enthusiast that in some ways this can be boring. So between September and maybe WWDC, mm -hmm. right? There's not a lot to talk about. Is that the... Yeah, so that's what, yeah, I wanted to approach it from the terminology that you folks use on the show. As a seeker, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I do get kind of bored uh, with okay. the operating system, but that's also a privileged position from which to speak, right? Because yep. how nice it is that I can get bored with it because it just works most of the time. Um, and so it, it's interesting, yeah. grass is always greener kind of situation because, yeah, I, I mean, and as, again, as someone whose livelihood is talking about this stuff uh, in both of our cases, then it you know, there, there is at least new stuff to talk about regularly. Um, but again, on the other side of that is if it's constantly being updated and there's constantly holes that need to be patched, that is, that is an issue. Uh, it's just two different approaches. And I, I, I was kind of curious, do you, what do you think is the reason which is better <laughs> no, no, not even which is better but what is it about the structure of microsoft versus the structure of apple that they are run that way was it is was it just a decision made by somebody a long mm -hmm. time ago and they've stuck with it or is it just there, the nature there of is no equivalent of the, of the windows insider program at apple right there's just the you know, you have no, well, you only beta. see what the, the developer public beta sees. Uh, right. would be the, the closest, but we don't have My all closest. of the different channels and all that kind of stuff. It's so I thing. would argue that part of that is that Microsoft, after the Department of Justice uh, consent decree back in 2001, basically agreed to be a more open company to show how they were making things, to show that they weren't working mm -hmm. against the public right. interest. Huh. And so that's just become reflex to tend to show off the sausage being made. That's interesting. It, there's so much. I really, we could we could devote two hours to this topic. I, mm -hmm. I it, it was fascinating to me back in the day when when Apple was kind of coming up in the world under Steve Jobs, that one of the big defenses that Microsoft would give to why they couldn't do things the way Apple was doing it at the time was because we have such a huge and diverse user base. And you could you could poll 100 Office users and every one of them would have 10 features that they needed that were unique and unlike the other 10 people or 100 people, whatever the number was. And um, but, you know, Apple has a very large and diverse user base today. And uh, I would say they're kind of on equal footing from that perspective. Um, in an age in which Windows is not at the center of the universe, it's weird to me that they would afford any time to updating with superfluous new features that nobody mm -hmm. needs or wants. Like, this is a platform we use to get work done on. It should be stable. It should be uh, unchanged. It should be, uh, you know, the enterprise model is, I think, the thing most Windows users do want. I, mm -hmm. People who are tech enthusiasts today, by and large, are not following Windows. They're, you know, they're they're following these mobile platforms, the web or whatever. And wow. um so what I is, just don't why I, why I, do I, it? What's the appeal of of releasing all these I don't know. silly features? It, it might be a bid to make it seem well. First of all, uh, th there's a bit of je uh, jealousy of the mobile platforms. I think that was part of it. So when w Windows 10 was coming around, I think one of the deals there was like, look, let's show that this thing is dynamic and improving, and it's just as exciting. We have a big user base, which we do. Um, but I think the nature of these platforms is a little different. And and honestly, I don't think you can really or should compare it to mobile. You should compare it to the Mac or Linux or whatever you want to pick. And and how are those things updated, right? And and to what extent are they updated every so often, right? Let me um, ask you this well, too. Is there any level, do you think, of the folks who are working on this stuff sort of um, – auditioning for the uh, maintaining of their of their roles. The, 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 what I mean is, are, th are the folks, is there any level of the folks working on Windows going, we know you're starting to pay attention to all this other stuff and Windows is kind of falling. We need to show you this is still just as uh, interesting to people and look at all the numbers that prove that, you know, what we're doing matters and, you know, I'm worried I... about, does that, does that have any role in it at all? I would love to think there were even adults working on Windows now. <laughs> I, I don't, I, I mean, look, I I accept and understand that this is not the focus, right? Mm -hmm. in, in the 10 years-ish that Satya Nadella has been around, the cloud was a big push. And you kind of look at that and you think, okay, well, you know, Windows is that part of the company that can't really do play a big role in that, right? 
um, they tried the way it's kind of bizarre when you think about it and related to what we're talking about that the way they tried to get it to conform to the way the cloud works is with the way that it updates you know um, we're going to try to even though this thing is a monolithic desktop installed operating system we're going to try to update it like it's an online service I, it, it's fair to say they honestly it took them a while but they kind of got there which is rather amazing like they do have the ability to update windows pretty seamlessly and, and that's actually a pretty good technical achievement but the, the thing i'm talking about is the the features right I, mm -hmm. I don't i don't understand what we're doing anymore we're, we're moving the cheese right we had a uh, they tested for two seconds this copilot thing in windows 11 where the button was on the taskbar and they moved it and i don't know why i don't know what was the point of that like what a, they're just moving stuff around now you know, and I, so I don't see it as a lot of adult supervision. I, it's not the, I, it's almost like the parents are looking elsewhere. So let's just screw around because who cares? You know, um, I, I, I can't think of a, a reasonable, responsible strategy reason to do the things the way they do at all. I don't get it. I just don't understand it. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how I got off on this tangent. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's kind of my fault. I, I, I but think. I, but no, no, it's okay. But it's, but it is coincidentally, I was, I was thinking about this. And when you were talking, I was thinking about asking this question because I look at the Mac from the outside and I think, you know, I like the way, that's the way it should be. That's the way you handle a mature, stable platform. Um, it doesn't need these big dynamic changes every quarter, every year, every whatever. It just doesn't. And um, I wish that Microsoft treated Windows with the same respect that I think that Apple treats the Mac, right? You've had the excitement with the silicon stuff, right? The, yeah, definitely. The, the switch to ARM has been very exciting on the Apple side. And uh, and we're going to get a little bit of that this year, by the way. We're finally kind of moving down that path on the, on the Windows side. But um, I, I mean, think, you know... It, it's just not that kind of platform. We don't use it to for social media, for game. Well, games we do, of course. I mean, but for like a lot of these little mobile, you know, the, a lot of the little personal technology workloads. That it's not where they're not workloads. They're like playloads. Um, we do that on mobile now, mm -hmm. you know. And um, I, I just don't. I just wish this was treat. I, I wish this was treated like I said with the respect. I think the Mac is on the Apple side. I, I wish it was just left alone. Like, but, and you're hinting around at one of the big issues here, which is that when it comes to the important part of Windows, it's the enterprise side of things. And the consumer yep. versions aren't getting anywhere near the same level of attention. What the right. enterprise wants is very different from what a typical consumer and how, would So want. how is it that they're not getting their way, right? No one is rushing out to stores and no one will ever rush out to stores to buy a new PC because of some new feature in Windows 11. No, you you missed the Windows 95 lineups. Is that what you're saying? It's a long time ago. As, as far as I can tell, that might even be science fiction. I don't even, I'm not sure that even happened and I lived through it. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, it's it's a different world. I mean, that's in the Sanofsky book. I mean, the, the Microsoft shift in focus from individuals who by and large were enthusiasts in the 1990s to what became what they call large organization lorgs like uh, enterprises. Um, change the way that they approach software development. And I don't think you, no, I know I, they haven't, but I don't think you can get back from that. I think that's the way that world went. Um, I, I I don't know. I, I don't understand it. I, all I can say, I, I just have to keep saying the same thing. I don't know why. I can, I, mm. no one, I don't think anyone could explain it to me. You know, I don't think there is an answer where I'd say, oh, OK, I get it. I've been I, yeah, I've been thinking this wrong the whole you know, the whole time. My mistake. Challenge well, we've talked, accepted. We, right? yeah. we have talked about a bunch of pieces of this where it's like, you know, I've said things like, you know, don't think it's only one team here. There's a bunch of different people yeah. trying different things. Uh, every so often we see them trying to organize them. But, yeah. uh, you know, the the Conway's law applies here. The, the product reflects the organizational structure that made it. Hmm. And so in some ways you're seeing a manifestation of them exploring their business model, or the development model in the product as it's being made. Right. I, you know, Microsoft right now obviously is rallying around AI and there's, there's some compelling stuff that can happen on the client with AI, whether it's in Windows or across the Microsoft Office apps or whatever it might be in. There, there are interesting little things, you know, um, but 
let's face it. I mean, we're not going to get any differentiating feature in Windows that's going to keep people there versus some other platform or versus mobile, et cetera, et cetera. But you could see that we could, right? I mean, we we noticed this right away in the last build when mm -hmm. and Stevie Batiste did his thing. It's like, you know what? Yeah. One of the great hubs for these large language model interfaces could be Windows. Mm -hmm. That's right. That it could provide a standardized interface to all kinds of software. That Now you'd have this interesting dynamic of, what software will be presented to the user through that interface. Yep. Um, I, but I, I think we both had the same reaction at the same time, which is like, I don't think the Windows team is up for this. I, don't I think, think, so I think I, M365 I, I, is going to win it. Yep. And and I, I this is going to come up. I, I'm going to really try hard. Not, I, I don't mean this to be insulting. I don't. And I want to be really careful here. But, um, you know, the best and the brightest at Microsoft and all on Windows it, that's just not the focus of the company. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, the notion that someone is going to come out of the windows business with this idea, this advance and, and have it impact the, it, it's just not the way things work anymore. Even when windows was on top of the world, um, within Microsoft, a lot of what it did as a team was ignored outside of the, <laughs> right. You know, office did its own user interfaces, um, didn't want to integrate with whatever, you know, storage system that Windows was going to have and then never had because that never worked, right? Because, you know, it's just that type of product. But I, I don't know. I'm struggling. <laughs> I'm trying. You know, I uh, you have to work pretty hard to chase me away from anything Microsoft or Windows. And um, it's happening because they're, they are trying really hard. It's the one thing they've been successful at. So I don't know, you know, what's going on here, but... Um, I look, I use windows every day, obviously on a multiple machines. I love it. And, um, there are these things I don't like, and I wish were different, but, um, I, I, I think what I, I think what I'm asking for or what I would wish for or whatever is just, you know, stability, consistency, liability, transparency, <laughs> predictability, you know, all those things I, th I think an enterprise would want. And it's, it's, it's curious to me that they're not doing it because that is the customer base. Largely, right. the enterprise is staying off Windows 11, right? They're yeah. all still there sitting on Win 10. Oh, so this is the okay, yeah. So they can kind of screw around here and see if anything works. I guess. I well, and at the same time, they're getting a lot of heat from the enterprise side to say group policy has to work. Authentication engines have to be the same. Like a yeah. lot of the stuff you're seeing put back into 11 is because enterprises said not go in there. That that represents hundreds of thousands of dollars in support tickets to me if you don't fix that. Yeah, I mean, I, I I suppose as businesses eventually are going to have to adopt Windows 11 or whatever comes down the road. They're I mean, being, I, being forced to, yes. Yeah, yeah. So they 20, should I, look. We we just hit on this. It's the same topic all over and over again. I I would pay for mm -hmm. this product. I want. I would if I could get uh, the enterprise version of Windows 11. You know, somehow as a consumer, easily if I could get it as part of a subscription that I already pay for or will pay for. Um, if I could pay a little bit extra and not be nagged every time I'm using one of their products, that'd be kind of nice. You know, uh, there's got to be a system that is a win-win, you know, uh, for users and for the company itself, I would think. It makes it sound like I'm down on Windows because the thing is, I just, you know, as I, uh, this is still the center of my universe when it comes to this stuff. And uh, I still prefer it to, you know, the Mac or Linux or Chrome OS or whatever. And, you know, it's like a kid who's doing bad in school. You know, I just uh, I want it to be as good as it can be. <laughs> you know, doesn't mean I don't love it. I just, but I, you know, I can see the problems and I'd like to, I wish they were fixed. I, he's, he's not angry. He's just disappointed. Mm -hmm. I'm not angry. Yeah, I am angry. Um, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> and making me further angry. And I, and I think this is something that applies to a lot of people like for example in the, in the apple world right when you look at what apple is doing in europe in the united states we're like can um, we have that yeah it, and wouldn't it be easier for you right like apple or microsoft just to do it the same way every way you know um I, I mean i referenced this probably months ago but when the gdpr came about microsoft at least and i think all the major cloud providers uh, or, uh basically said look, it's really hard to adhere to these regulations. We're going to do this work and we're going to apply them worldwide. Everyone's going to benefit from this, right? Mm -hmm. And so when this DMA uh, and then the, what's the other one, the digital, the the sister act, um, digital, we, we've lost sight of it because the DMA is so big, but whatever the other one is, when these two 
sets of regulations came about, you know, naively, I think a lot of us were like, you know, maybe we'll do that again, you know, and they're not right. They're not doing that. Um, you can see it very aggressively with Apple. It's very interesting for Apple to be on the receiving end of a lot of bad PR uh, because of the belligerent way that they're handling things for Microsoft guys like me, this is like riding a bike. I've seen this story before. Like I, you know, we saw Bill Gates slouching down in his chair during the depositions from the U S antitrust case, you know, debating the, the, the definition of the term, the, you know, I mean, this is what Apple looks like now. They look like jerks, mm -hmm. you know? So Microsoft is coming off a little better, although they're basically doing the same thing. Right. Um, and that's the, the other big kind of windows 11 story this week is last Friday or Thursday, they published, I think in tandem with that day where the switchover was supposed to happen, you know, how they're changing windows in the, well, the European economic area, right. To meet the needs of the DMA. And uh, they're going to let you do all kinds of fun stuff. You know, you can get rid of uh, Microsoft edge. You can get rid of Bing, right. You can, um, you, you don't have to, well, I, I actually think of this as a nicety, but one of the key benefits of a Microsoft account is you get what I think of as pass through authentication, right? You've signed into windows with a Microsoft account. When you go into edge, you're there, right? All of your stuff passes through. Um, you maybe you're using your Microsoft account to store your passwords. These things go, you know, they work with apps, they work with uh, websites through Microsoft Edge, etc. Um, this stuff is all, you know, because of the impact of the DMA. Um, you know, people in Europe are going to start having choices, right? Interestingly, there there are examples of things that they've done for the DMA that they've said, you know what, we're just going to do this everywhere, right? So one of them is the widgets thing. I think it was two, three weeks ago, I had this tip that uh, this came up before the DMA deadline, but they uh, uh, now allow you to go into widgets and turn off that Microsoft start news feed thing, which is terrible, mm. uh, which is wonderful. So you could choose to use widgets. I know it's going to be crazy just for the widgets, yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Uh, I know, I know, it's nuts. What a concept. Um, you could also, if, if it existed, could install an extension or add-in, whatever they're going to call it, that would uh, allow a third party to provide their news feed inside of widgets. To my knowledge, that hasn't yet occurred, but it could, right? And so they've turned this thing into kind of an open platform, which is, you know, the essence of Windows to me, Um that you could say, look, I want to use Windows, but I want to use Chrome and I should be allowed to use Chrome everywhere, like not just somewhere. In some places, um, I, I want to use widgets, but I don't want to use the Microsoft feed. I want to use, you know, whatever the Google feed that will never occur or whatever it might be. Um, so Microsoft, uh, not quite as belligerent, right, as Apple in this case. But there are example, many examples of things that are only in Europe and then some that are everywhere. I think a lot of this uh, ability to uninstall inbox apps, meaning in in Dashbox, not email apps, but apps that are included with Windows, which actually started a couple of years ago, um, might have been related to regulations are coming, we should just do this, and they're letting you kind of do it everywhere, you know? Um, so that's good. It's not all bad, right? It's not all bad. But still, you see these news stories and it's like, uh, I don't, I can't afford to move to France. Could I right. just have this too? Or, you know? I'm with you. Uh, there, yeah. in fact, I just talked about that this morning on one of the shows that I do clockwise about uh, mm -hmm. the things from the EU through the DMA that Apple is changing and what things we wish. And I, it's kind of piecemeal. There are a few things that I'm okay with not having, but then there are others mm -hmm. where I think, oh, that would be a yeah. better experience. But uh, but ultimately, I think most people, unless, uh, you must have, I mean, you, you're I have these guys. I think everyone does. Like, there are some people who just believe these companies should be able to do with them. Oh, absolutely. You know, whatever. Yeah, definitely. And, and, okay, fine. God, <laughs> God love you. Antitrust exists for a reason. Um, please wake up. But whatever. Um, I, 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 we don't begrudge others to have the choices we might not take. <laughs> we just want them to have the choice, right? In other words, yeah, there might be. I might not want to ever uninstall Safari or Microsoft Edge. In my case, I don't but mind I, that that's a mm -hmm. thing, right? Exactly. Why, why would we? Why would I care that other people want to do that? It's fine. Mm -hmm. Let them do it. You know, I, I look, I, I have to use Microsoft Edge sometimes. I write a book about Windows, right? Like I, you know, I have to know something about it, but I have chosen in my day-to-day -day life um, not to use it for so many reasons because it's terrible. But 
to each their own. You know, you can use it if you want. You're just making bad decisions. You can't help you with that. <laughs> so you're, you're okay with them being decisions. wrong. Yeah, yeah. I'm okay. You're okay. You're a little mental, but you're okay. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, I teach their own. It's fine. That's how uh, you're, but you're making me think of Windows N, right? That they did make yes. special versions of Windows just for the EU. Yeah. Uh, to be yeah, and actually uh, tied to that. So I didn't write about this today, but Brave came. I think they just tweeted it. This might be why they didn't have an announcement. Um, Brave, the alternate browser maker, said, this is a chart of our adoption on iOS. And there's this giant spike at the end. That was when the DMA went into effect because mm -hmm. in the European economic area, when you have a new install of iOS or you bring up an iPhone or whatever for the first time, you get a screen just like that browser ballot that we had in Windows and mm -hmm. Windows N that says, hey, there's a bunch of browsers. Which one did you want to use? And they, you know, they randomized the order. A lot of people are prick and brave all of a sudden, you know, right. and, the, and their whole thing is like, that's what happens when you give people a choice. Mm -hmm. People take a choice, <laughs> you know, they make a choice. Right. There's your little graphic if you're watching. Yeah, I, so, I was I saw that, too. And I thought this is good. This is how it should be. This is. Yeah, this, this is this is an open uh, market at work. You yeah. know, well, and it, and it makes the case for what the EU did. Exactly. Like we, we talk a lot about overreaching government regulation and so forth. But it's like when they when they did what the EU specified, people made other choices. And that's a pretty clear yes. hint that they did the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. I don't know. It is about respect though, right? You know, I want, you know, you want Windows or whatever you use. You want the product you're using uh, to respect your choices. You know, we don't click a, we don't make a choice so you could ignore it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, it's that's just, it's, really it's, frustrating. Whenever it's that a happens. bizarre, uh, it's a bizarre behavior. So yeah, I, I it, that actually just happened to me today. Um, I, uh, uh, will I name the company? I don't know. Maybe I will at the end. We'll see. But um, <laughs> okay. this, this updating app for the different, apps that I have from this company uh, popped up and immediately it alerted me of a change that I had made on purpose, which was I turned off the uh, feature for it to auto launch. Oh, this sounds like, you're talking about Microsoft, aren't you? I said, don't this auto launch it login. It's, it's it, not. It, 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 okay, because that sounds sound like, like it. That, but, okay. uh, said, yep. Probably. I said, don't auto launch it login. I don't want you to do that. I'll start you when right. I'm ready. And so I went in to do the software right. updates for the two apps that were ready. And then it presented me with a little banner at the bottom that said, there's an update for this updater app. And there was not an update, but if I clicked that button to do the update, uh, it's going to re go through the system and it's going to turn on those auto uh, launch prompts at the beginning. Are you sure you're not talking about Microsoft? This sounds about, a lot. I'm talking about Adobe. <laughs> it sounds a lot like Microsoft. It's Adobe. Okay. Mm -hmm. There you go. Well, that, that's why it sounds a lot like Microsoft. <laughs> yeah. <exactly. laughs> sure. Yeah. I thought, oh, that's that's very tricky, and that's wrong. <laughs> and again, and it's about wrong. respect. Don't it's change not, my default. Exactly. Yeah, it's not even a dark pattern. It, it's just a it's blatant, bad right? behavior, so, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. and <laughs> that's oh boy. Yeah, I do. I could see Adobe doing that. Yeah, they're very they're <sighs> very serious about having their stuff start as soon as the system starts. And look, there's an argument to be made that. Part of that is mm -hmm. a security mindset that you do want to have the latest version, especially of something like Adobe Acrobat, because PDFs yep. are a great way to get in. But ultimately, the telemetry and all this that was, jazz that they get is also part uh, of it. Uh, January 2015, you know, Terry Morrison uh, announced a bunch of things. One, of, I think this might have been the initial HoloLens reveal, right? One of the things they announced was that uh, Windows 10 was going to be a free upgrade for everybody. Windows 7 users, Windows 8 users, Windows Phone users, remember? Um, but there was a little asterisk, right? We we are going to keep your uh, your device up to date. Now this is going to be on us. We're do, we're going to do this. But I think one of the thing this was Windows as a service, as they called it, right? Now it's called continuous innovation. But the the notion that we want everyone to be uh, or as many customers as possible to be on the same version is a good one from a security standpoint. It's easier to update systems that are on the same version, right? You don't have to make multiple versions of patches. And we've talked a lot about how they completely screwed it up because every single version of Windows 11 or 10 was a different version of Windows and required a different patch and whatever. But they got there. They, they, like I said, they, they actually got to the point where they were good at doing this. And that's great. But um, this we're talking about features. You know, you're adding features. You're not fixing security problems. You're just arbitrarily adding features. Um, when Richard's first joined the show, 
a year and a half ago ish uh, almost we were in the midst of this uh it was 22 h2 at the time unannounced in early december late november all of a sudden one drive changed right but not for everybody and it wasn't until I, and i mean this this sounds impossible but it wasn't until about a month or two ago there were three different versions of OneDrive out in the world. And if you did a clean install of Windows 11 23H2, as recently as a month or two ago at the most, you got the first version of OneDrive, not the, not the second or third. Like it's, and to this day, I, I, you could all go and look yourself, I guess. But if you look at OneDrive settings and folder backup, um, some people still see three folders. Some people see five. <laughs> you know, mm. it depends. And and I this is the the it's the uncertainty bit of this that I find strange. Not just the timing of how the update goes out or who gets the update or, you know, it's it's there are literally features out in the world that just are not on some computers and, we, and no one can explain why. Um, you could have twenty two H two now and have every single feature in twenty three H two, but you're just on twenty two H two and why well, I don't know why. <laughs> you know, I can't, I can't explain it. I don't think Microsoft could explain it. That's, it's weird. Like it's a, it's a new world we live in. It's, um, I obviously am struggling. I've been babbling for an hour probably about this now because I can't, I try to be okay with it. And I just, I, it just doesn't make sense to me. So I'll, I'll move on. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Round <laughs> just, us out. With I'm the trying. Windows you know. Insider here. Whew. On the therapist couch. <laughs> How does that make you feel? All right, feel? so th <laughs> there's been some action in the Windows Insider program since the last show. Uh, if you've been paying attention over the past couple of months, you may recall that for a while now, it seems like all of the big updates are coming out at the end of the week after our show every week. This week, they actually released a bunch of stuff today. So they're kind of getting back on what I think of as a normal schedule. But there was a beta build last week where they added some uh, new co-pilot actions. I'm going to try not to be cynical and say something like, meaning you'll see it in stable in three weeks, but you never know. Um, this was how they deployed the change with the co-pilot button, moving it over to the far side of the taskbar. And the way that this works now is as you most, and it's an experiment they're calling it, but it will, it will definitely appear in Windows at some point, is you kind of mouse over this thing. And if there are things that co-pilot can do with something maybe you copy to the clipboard or whatever, um, you will see actions, right? In a list, in like a, a context menu as you mouse over the co-pilot um, button, right? In other words, you've copied some text into the clipboard, you mouse over this thing and it says, hey, do you want to summarize this thing? Do you want me to explain it? Do you want to just put it into chat and you can do more with it? Um, that kind of thing. So that's good. That's fine. But again, we're probably just going to get that together. <laughs> Um, but the bigger news happened today. So today, uh, after I think it was just one set of builds, maybe two, uh, on different build numbers, they put the Canary and Dev channels back on the same build again. Remember, we were doing that for a while. This is the system we expect to become at Windows 11 24H2, or what we used to call uh, Windows 12, right? Hmm. And um, there's some big stuff going on here. So the biggest one is the Teams client, right? There have been two different versions of the, the I'll call it the consumer Teams client in Windows 11 in just a few years. The um, one that nobody should use, right? <laughs> yeah, neither which, well, neither which anyone used, right? Mm -hmm. um, separate from the Microsoft Teams app for commercial customers, of which there have also been two major releases, right? You know, the classic version now and the new version, which I think most customers would agree the new one is better. But of course, what people want assuming they want it for consumer use at all or for personal use, is like one client, right? Um, right now, you could have three different versions of Microsoft Teams in your start menu. If you search your computer for Teams, I don't know if we can all do this together. Uh, I have two, I guess. Um, but uh, Microsoft Teams, which curiously is not what I think of as Teams, right? The consumer app, and then also Microsoft Teams Work or School, which is the the real teams. Um, so they're going to start integrating what they're calling now the unified teams client, which is going to include both uh, consumer and commercial support in one client, just like we see on mobile. That will be part of Windows 11 24H2, if not sooner. We'll see. Um, that's something that Microsoft's been talking about separately, kind of unifying these clients. So it will be included in Windows Um and this will be a fun uh, product bundling complaint for antitrust we can talk about in about six months. It'll be good. 
Um, cause I missed the nineties <laughs> and I'm sure the slack people are not excited at this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Ex mm -hmm. You're right. Thank yes. That's right. Exactly right. Well, you know, what's going to happen is, uh, windows 11 users in Europe, uh, probably won't see this. So they'll be able to remove it or whatever. Well, everyone should be able to remove it, but, um, there were a bunch of copilot updates uh coming as part of moment five these are kind of related copilot windows i should say this is related to the make windows do things or set settings and so forth um there's a bunch more being tested now in Dever, uh, dev and canary although some users are seeing some are not etc cetera, etc cetera. but this build also is a bunch of smaller um improvements um uh, the way that progress bars work and taskbar icons i'm sure most of you are thinking what are you talking about there there are progress bars but there are if you do like a big File copy, for example, you'll see a little progress bar under hmm. the file. Explorer. Downloads in Edge too show mm -hmm. the progress bar. Yeah, so there's a visual change there. Let's make it a little more obvious what that is. Um, live captions, which is honestly an awesome accessibility feature, mm -hmm. is getting a quick settings tile. I don't think they're using the term tile, but it's a button. If you open quick settings, you'll see there's a grid of these things. You can add and remove those. Um, and uh, live caption will be one of them. It's not there today. Uh, and then some other stuff, but that's the, you know, this is, we're starting to see some movement here and, um, we have, uh, you know, moment five, which is sort of happening right now as we speak a little bit, depending on where you're at. And then we have, uh, 24 H2 formerly, you know, the operating system formerly known as windows 12, uh, we're going to know it by us like a squirrely symbol at some point, um, is coming in the second half of the year. So there's, there is a lot happening <laughs> and I, Micah could be jealous of that, I guess. I don't know. I, <laughs> um, <laughs> And there was also a new beta build today. Um, not a big deal, but if you're familiar with the new start menu in Windows 11, you know that there's a pin section and a recommended section. By default, a recommended section. I don't know why they call it recommended, but it's recently installed apps and recently installed, I'm uh, sorry, recently accessed documents. They kind of intermingle. Um, you can configure that, obviously, to, or maybe not, obviously. You can configure that to show only one or the other. Uh, but coming in beta, meaning we're probably going to get it before this summer in stable, is your most frequently used apps will now appear there. And I guess the theory is like, you know, to my mind, like, why don't they just appear in pinned? You know, one of the the configuration options Microsoft might make would be say, hey, here's an idea, like um, order them by use, you know, <laughs> like, but I guess that's the area where you get to choose what's there and what order they're in. You can make folders and stuff and I, maybe they don't want to touch that. So um, they're going to add a third type of thing to recommended, which I still think is a terrible name for that area, but whatever. So there you go. Not Nothing. Well, I don't know. So I, it's all good news is what you're telling me. <laughs> yeah. All that's good. what I'm saying. Yeah. To summarize the past 57 minutes, I have nothing but good news. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. You can just, in fact, maybe just cut the 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 front of that show right off and just uh, it's just all just, good. Just start it there. Yeah. All right, Microsoft <laughs> up next. Uh, a more general look at Microsoft after we just covered Windows 11. Plus, as is always my way, I asked both Paul and Richard some thought exercise style questions that resulted yeah. in some rants. <laughs> I um, You have a unique ability to trigger me. No, no. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Sorry, sorry. That's Microsoft. It's not you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just bring it to the forefront, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We dig into it. All right. No, you know what it is? I, you know, I'm sorry to interrupt, but no, it, because you approach this from the outside and you just have this kind of uh, normal worldview, right? Like when, when you ask a question like that, it's like, right. <laughs> like, it's like, right. This is so stupid. This is what I've been saying like this, this whole thing, time, right? <laughs> th this whole, like the whole world I'm in is so bent and wrong. And then you're just like, I don't understand why it's like this. You're like, yes, thank you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, good. Well, that helps that I'm, I'm uh, yeah. confirming that you, you're, yes. yeah. What you're, what you're believing and feeling is valid, Paul. That's, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> I'm okay. You're okay. <laughs> We're all okay. Somebody loves me. So how is uh, Microsoft dealing with all of these hacks that are going on? Mm -hmm. uh, poorly in the sense mm -hmm. that there, there's been some, so Microsoft uh, divulged <laughs> a couple of months ago that they had had an incursion, right? In their corporate systems by a Russia sponsored uh, hacker group. And we've now gotten three sets of revelations about this. It's not getting better. It's getting worse, right? And I would—I wasn't necessarily in this group, but 
right away people were saying, oh, the way they're talking about this is a little squirrely, you know? It's almost like they're purposefully not telling us everything, you know? And Microsoft has tried to position their disclosures as being transparent that will let you know more when we know more. In the beginning, the big story was like, look, this the two things I would say. One was that it wasn't a, a software bug in a modern Microsoft system that caused this. And it didn't affect any customer data, right? And then over time, it's like, well, okay, actually, uh, I guess they kind of hacked into our systems. They got in front of more data than we thought. Now they're saying they actually accessed our source code, you know, which um, I think for a company like Microsoft, you could consider the crown jewels, right? Depending on which source code we're talking about, I suppose. Yeah. Recognizing most of the source code is on GitHub, where it's publicly accessible. Yeah. Well, and, you know, there, the notion that this group used what I think a lot of people might term a fairly unsophisticated attack and was able to get through um, speaks to a little bit of a management issue because Microsoft has so many systems in VMs and in um, uh, in physical uh, systems as well. It's, kind of, it's probably hard to kind of keep track, um, but they... Uh, this group seems like they were pretty successful. So mm. um, it's kind of a weird thing in um, 2024 now for something like this, of this scale to kind of happen. And I feel like we're not done with this, right? I, I well, think- Well, here's we the question. More... Why are they talking about it? It's not, there's no requirement for public disclosure. No customer right. data has been jeopardized. Why are they talking about it at all? Mm. Like yeah, nobody builds question. PRs by accident. This is hard work. Why would well, you choose to do this? Who are you talking to, actually? So if you if you had asked me this after the initial disclosure, I would have said two reasons. One is that some of Microsoft's customers were seeing some of the same type of attacks. And I think Microsoft saw something that indicated that these guys were also going after. I think it was HPE um, and I don't remember the other companies, a couple of other companies. And so I think part of it was, look, this is going to get out. We, we, you know, we need to discuss it to some level, but one of the reasons you talk about this as a, when you're a company like Microsoft is because it might make you look good, right? We discovered this thing. We stopped it. Nothing serious happened. I, I think the problem is it, it was more serious than they let on. And I don't mm -hmm. know if they knew this back in January and maybe now they're kind of backed into a corner a little bit, but um, Yesterday on Security Now, Steve Gibson took issue with the fact that Microsoft released and I guess has maybe now shown a pattern of releasing this news on Friday evenings, um, yes. which is traditionally a classic. Known, it's a classic yeah, in the corporate world. Taking out the garbage. After the markets close. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. And I mean, yeah, you, you point out that this is kind of in the fact that they caught it and all that jazz. I wonder, though, if there isn't some level of um, requirement, right? It, once, once there it, normally once it is, but only government. And, right. Yeah, but normally governments would, especially the, they're making hints that this is, does involve FBI, DIA. That's the true. Could folks be, would say release yeah. nothing. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, so the, the couple of the things we've been banging around, folks I've been talking to on this is the government can't release it themselves so they're asking microsoft to do it because it's useful for political positioning um there's also the internal angle because one of the things they announced especially in the initial release is that they're doing a major security wash throughout the company and it is fairly common practice at microsoft to do public releases about changes in behavior that they want within the company so they kind of can't take them back everybody knows we're doing this now so we have to do yeah. it so this, you know, this, what this is, came out in the second disclosure was this notion of we had already announced this new version of what I think of as the trustworthy computing 2.0 initiative, right? This event has shown us that what we're going to do, among other things, using AI to sort of al algorithmically discover attacks, et cetera, et cetera, is the right approach. And as it turns out, we're going to have to move more quickly to make this happen. So mm -hmm. had Microsoft, I'm sure they looked at these changes, just like the changes they made in server for 2003 that with that initiative back then, where the, the functionality became very difficult to use because they had to lock everything down. Things broke and things are going to break with this too. And I think this is their way of making the medicine easier to swallow. It's like, look, we didn't want to do this to you guys. We were going to ease this in, but this is really serious. See, so we have to do we have to make these breaking changes now. 
Uh, and maybe it's just a way to kind of get those things over the hump. Mm -hmm. it, ultimately, that, I mean, that might be the right thing to do. It's kind of a weird stance to take, but. Um, but we've seen him got, do it before. So it does got, look right. like a familiar pattern. Yeah. You get customers who are like, yeah, I don't care. We're not doing it. And it's like, no, we have you really to do need it. to. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, it's not us. It's the Russian guys, you know? Mm -hmm. um, no, I, 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 again, it, it, this is borderline conspiracy theory in a way, but I, I, I do think there's something to it, right? That uh, you know what the right thing is to do. You know you're going to get pushback from your most important customers. Oh, you got hacked too? Oh, like, I guess we're going to have to get going, huh? Yeah, we did, <laughs> kind of, we did kind of telegraph that this was a possibility. So, right. you know, you had an opportunity to act before it got this serious. Yeah. Yeah, if so, this yeah. was a uh, a true crime show, eventually there would be the episode where we find out that Microsoft, in fact, was the one that hacked itself to make <laughs> this happen. You know, <laughs> it's, uh, thank goodness it's yeah, not a how true far crime do you show. Want to go with this? Uh, yeah. yeah. What's the, who's your state sponsor now? <laughs> yeah, exactly. A uh, Russian sponsored group called Microsoft.com uh, broke into. Uh, yeah, I don't know. No one no. clip that and take it out of context. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it is interesting. That obviously, there's more going on. There's a lot of of uh, sub posting going on here. They are yes. not actually speaking to the public. I actually think that you know, in a bid to be transparent, they're coming off as not at all transparent. Yes, and that's we all when, feel the creepy. Yes, and that's when you start talking, right? And yeah. that's the the why we're speculating because I, I you know. I would say the first announcement, I was like, eh, I don't know. You know, I think Richard, you were pretty much right. You were like, I don't know. This seems kind of squirrely to me. Like this is not, mm. you know, this is, this is a fake disclosure, right? Or yeah. fake transparency. Right. Yeah. Because it doesn't fit the normal disclosure profile. Yeah. Right. The normal disclosure profile is customer data has been impacted. And here's how we're mitigating it. And that's not what happened here. Why right. are you talking about this? Because they do routinely deal with these state-sponsored actors in a variety of ways. Go back yes. and watch the Hafnium exploit, and, because that was affecting customers. And it was state actors that were doing it. Right. And they had a heavy FBI involvement. Like, all of those pieces were there. This is not the same. Yeah. Yeah. There, yeah. Yeah. That, no, that, there's... Right. And, and the more they talk... You know, it's like me at the top of the show. I went mm -hmm. on and on about Microsoft. At some point, you're like, okay, we get it. Mm -hmm. it it's, it's, it feels like that a little bit. Like, what? You're still talking about this? What's going mm -hmm. on? What, what, why? You, I'm sorry. You're, you're still finding things out. What, what are you doing? Like, what, you know, it feels a little off. Yeah. You know? And why are you disclosing them? It's yeah. interesting. Yep. Yeah. Maybe you... someday we'll have a full story here, but I feel like, when, you know, I would have said Not this, this last time we talked about yeah. this. I don't think we're done. No, yeah, I don't you know? think we're done either. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think there's more to come. Yeah. Especially given just the, once you have access to those emails and the emails of their cybersecurity I team, I mean, there's just so much that's involved here that who knows? I know. Who knows? I have a hard enough time changing the passwords in my password manager. I can only imagine when it's like at Microsoft right now, <sighs> they're trying to figure out, my God, like the, just the the chain of emails, you know, mm -hmm. just that they might have gotten access to all the information there, you know, the source source code. Jeez, I mean, like, I don't. It, it's yeah, but source code is a done. super vague term, you know. Senior yeah. emails, like it could have been nothing too. Like yep. there's no concept of what the content was. There's a lot of source code flying around Microsoft, most of which is publicly accessible anyway. Like I'm not sure the fact that they're that vague about those statements. Again, why? Right. Why? Because it makes uh, it appear, are you trying to make it appear more threatening than it actually was? Or are less you, threatening you know, than it actually Or are you just is. getting ahead of it, right? In other mm -hmm. words, uh, the hacker group uh, maybe is going to disclose information that would might be embarrassing. Yeah, um, and so you've already disclosed it. You've already disclosed it, right? Which is also a common well, tactic. But, but that's, and that's the whole thing is there's been no signal of Midnight Blizzard trying to extort Microsoft. I know. Yeah, that's, that's, the that's odd, signal. isn't it? They've yeah. never bragged about this. They've nope. never talked about it. Yeah, uh, which again might be another reason for the disclosure, right? Is we see you. We know who you are. Yes, there you go. Okay. Well, I'd like, I mean, maybe someday we'll have a full story here. Yeah, I mean, there could yeah. be a book that comes out of this. This could be a, you know, this could be a big, big deal. I guess we'll mm. see, but. It's gotten bigger. We know that much. Midnight Blizzard, the trilogy. Mm. Yeah. I, to riff on uh, Keb Brewer's thing, it's like, we know what you did last summer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so uh, there were rumors, and now it's a fact. Uh, Microsoft is holding a, an event on March 21st, which is in about, what, a week? I mean, next yeah. week, I guess, next Thursday. What's up with the short notice on these things? I know. Well, I think we, li we live in an era now where everything kind of leaks, you know? Like, the yeah. remember the Xbox event uh, this past month? They were going to hold off until the end of this month, and then it leaked. Oh, yeah, okay, so I think they're just trying to get out into the world or whatever. We had heard rumors that Microsoft is going to be releasing a Surface Pro 10 and Surface Laptop 10 in both Intel and ARM variants, right? Kind of interesting. Also that the ARM versions would be delayed because that stuff's happening a little bit later in the spring. Um, but they've come out and said that Microsoft they, uh, has come out and said, yeah, we're going to have this event. It's going to focus on what they call a new era of work, right? So Copilot, Windows, and Surface. Um, which to me sounds a little bit like the September event, right? Mm -hmm. uh, except that uh, Surface, La if it is Surface Laptop and Surface Pro, those are the two core Surface devices, right? If they're, yeah. they're, so we will see what this looks like. I'm I'm curious. I have my eye on Surface Laptop. I wouldn't mind getting a, a big Surface Laptop. Yeah. Uh, Presumably blah, 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 blah. all with AI chips in them, like inevitably. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it you is Microsoft, hope. so it's yeah. possible, no. But yes, I, I even Microsoft should. Because it's I too soon service. for Intel Ultras, Because so it's got to be something else. Oh, jeez. <laughs> okay. Well, um, well, I mean, Qualcomm's had that stuff for a while, so mm. it could be at least in those. So we'll see. Okay. We'll see. <laughs> I don't want to say, you know, I don't. Uh, I, 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 you, we can't make any promises, right? right? Um, Richard, what do you know about this one? I, I, I learned about this kind of last minute. There was actually an event recently in New York uh, mm -hmm. for kind of a small group of people about something called Microsoft Copilot for security, which yeah. uh, they could have used on their internal systems before that Russian mm -hmm. hack thing. Um, what is I, what 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 exactly does a Copilot for security even look like? Well, I, I don't understand this. To start with, it was one of the first co-pilots announced after github co-pilot like even before yeah. m365 and anything they talked about a security co-pilot very early on which okay. is to say obviously they had been working on it for some time yep and coincidentally i have a sh run as episode that's going to publish the first week of april about co-pilot for security which is the renaming it used to be security co-pilot right uh, yeah because they so changed all the, yeah. they changed names all of the time the it is a terrible name it's a dreadful yeah. name. So is Azure Copilot. Like, what's what's great about GitHub Copilot? You know what it does, right? It it, it acts as a source code from GitHub to help provide you with code, right? Um, as soon as you get into these macro things like security, like you're going to try and give that a definition in any way, it gets kind of impossible. The, the conversation I had with George, we very much dug into this, helping you navigate the strata of event logs and streams and so forth to see where things are going on. One thing right. LLMs are very good at is summarization of data. Mm -hmm. So that's certainly an element. So then right away you're pressing is then a seam like Microsoft Sentinel. No, 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 not that. It's like, <laughs> you know, we get back to this idea that that there shouldn't be any products that are specifically LLMs, that LLMs should be included in products we're already using. But I yeah. do think, uh, and it's certainly the direction we went in in this conversation, not to give away the show, uh, that most folks that are working on security in organizations are part-time, right? You're a normal sysadmin and you get to put the tinfoil hat on once a month. And so the idea that you have a tool that really maintains state that knows where you are in your security efforts to help you go to the next thing and address the next most significant problem to continue to strengthen your security profile for your organization, it's a pretty useful tool. Um, yeah, so it's cross product. It, that's the hope. Uh, certainly it's you know looking across all of your uh, uh, data streams all of the mm -hmm. login spaces and so forth, which is part of the challenge, right? When you right. go to set up a seam like Sentinel, you're mostly trying to direct all of these conduits of potential security information into a place where you can see uh, before the disaster strikes that, you know, a breach is underway. A typical ransomware attack is three to six months long. So they've been in the system for a long time. And post facto, you know, after the bomb goes off, you can go and see that they've been poking around for months. 
But a, the whole point of a, a system like Sentinel is to pick that up before it goes off so that you can start fighting back. Um, and that shouldn't be what Security Copilot's about. There is a product for that, but it sh can be something to help lead you down those paths. So um, I think they're taking a terrible risk with this product. I do too. <laughs> I do too. I, I feel like the the function, that, well, I, I guess it's the cross product part of it that makes it make a little bit of sense, but I, I, you almost I think want- it's, it's the implied promise. I have yeah. a co-pilot for my security. It's like narrow the scope, man. It's too much. It's like, hey, co-pilot, uh, secure my environment. All right, have a good weekend, everybody. Done, thanks. I pressed <laughs> the easy I, I, button. It seems a little, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you've ever done any kind of a, a corporate rollout of Microsoft technologies, you know that there's this notion of uh, best practices, right? That Microsoft has established across their products, and they, you know, they've 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 built that into products in a way. But I would say to date, not that I do a lot of this, but I mean, what I see when I look at like Microsoft 365 is, um, or you set up, uh, well, Azure ID now, I guess. What used to be Azure Active Directory. I mean, you 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 kind of go through what's basically it looks at your system and it says, okay, you've got a few problems here, and you go through a, kind of a checklist, and it's hopefully one that's uh, sorted by priority, right? Um, where you are configuring the system in a way that meets the best practices, right? And I guess the promise of this, although again, I I don't see how this works exactly, would be that it does that for you. I guess it. Mm. Um, one would I, I, I hope we we don't have a clear picture of exactly yeah. how that's going <laughs> right. um, That it's launching on April first is probably coincidental, but I think mm. I'll just point it out uh, just in case. <laughs> you know, um, it's I don't know. I'm a little. This one's this one's they, interesting. They are launching on a Monday. You know, yeah. they, they and this falls into the same umbrella of things like making sure your data estate is in order. Right. Yeah. Like they talk about if you're going to implement M365 Copilot, it's important to have your data as state in order. Right. What does that even mean? Right. It, and really what it is, is you're setting security rights for all of the data that this tool is about to index and surface to everyone. Yep. Uh, the question is, how would you know when your data state was in order? Like, does a little red light turn on when you got it nailed? It's yeah, so different I think they're going to introduce are, this. Uh, it will be a brand new feature, Richard. It's called, a, it's a green badge. Mm-hmm. That will let you know when everything's good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, uh, Copilot, as I think of it, at least the Copilots I've used, uh, are sort of one-way streets. Uh, you go to it, you do something, and you walk away. Mm -hmm. I think security requires more of an automated... Uh, Re-entrancy. Yeah. yeah. Like you, you want to hear from it, yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, so we, I guess, I don't know, is it going to be a two-way conversation here? I don't know. This is Which kinda... would be a heck of a progress. Was a, uh, what I find interesting is it was annou announced very early on. And again, I think there was a lot of pressure from Satya yes. for all these teams to do something. And many of them that it are, you know, the, as is, was true for the Bing team, many of them are already working on a product in that space, just latched on to the uh, open AI libraries to upgrade their own stuff. And here you go, we're there. But it's one yeah. thing to make announcements, another thing to ship a product. So we, mm -hmm. we're we mostly hoping, you know, one of the concerns for me now, if they're going to roll this thing out on April 1st, is on April 3rd, my show's going to come out. It may be wildly wrong. Yes. I recorded it yep. a couple of weeks ago. Maybe you need a little disclaimer at the beginning. <laughs> it might have case, to. I'll have know. to write a, record yeah. a bumper and go, yeah, this yeah. was recorded before the announcement. So, yeah, yeah, right. Or I will be rushing to re redo it. Be Based on our learnings from the uh, <laughs> hack, we have uh, rushed this product to market. Yeah. Mm. Well, it's part of my life. Recording in advance has consequences. Yeah. It also has advantages, by the way, um, mm. which I'm very jealous of. Because, um, <laughs> you know, I, everything I do is kind of spur of the moment news related, blah, 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 whatever. But you get to put a bunch of stuff in the can. It's all kind of lined up. It's nice. Yeah. And I work with my sponsors on, you know, stories that they're excited about that fits well mm -hmm. with the products, like all of that goes together. Right. Right. It's good. Well, we'll see. We have what, two weeks, about two weeks from now, mm -hmm. two weeks from Monday, I guess. Um, and then uh, this is something I never, I don't really pay too much attention to this, although I'm very interested in the dev space, but people probably know this notion that Microsoft Teams is a powerful enough platform that it supports apps, of course, and third parties can create these apps. 
And I'm sure this is not the only way, but Microsoft has a free toolkit that you add into Visual Studio that allows you, that provides you with things like you would see in Visual Studio, like templates for different types of apps that you might want to run in Teams. And they have added uh, AI capabilities to this. So you can add AI to an app that you would write for Microsoft Teams, including an AI chatbot that would run within Teams and be one of those things you kind of interact with. Um, so possibly it works off for your corporate data or whatever, and you can have that kind of in, in-house um kind of uh, what we used to think of as a, um, we used to call this a, uh, we used to call in-house corporate apps a, whatever it was. It's like not a public app, like just one, you know, internal application. Oh, yeah. gotcha. Yeah. Uh, that type of thing. So this mm -hmm. thing is called the tools, uh, te sorry, the Teams Toolkit for Visual Studio. It's been around for a little while. Um, requires the latest version of Visual Studio, but if you get the latest version of this toolkit, it, it has a bunch of stuff in there for, um, working not just for ai but a bunch, there's some other new features as well but there's some ai features in there that might be of interest um to developers okay what else uh and then moving off of microsoft uh most people probably don't know this but <laughs> opera has well, my opera has a browser called opera one they've kind of made this their flagship browser the their innovation such as this or their idea is that rather than tack ai onto the browser we'll architect this thing um, to be kind of AI focused from the beginning. And now that they've kind of made this architectural shift uh, and they've added their own AI capability called Aria, they want to start adding AI features probably at a fairly furious clip. So they've created a feature drops program, right? Uh, a la Pixel, I guess, where you could join this, use Opera One and you get early access to these new AI features and you can um, uh, test them and provide feedback, et cetera, and maybe impact the product. So if you're running Opera One on Windows, Mac, or Linux, this is available right now in the, I think it's the dev channel or beta channel. I think it's the dev channel. I don't see it in my own history. Mm -hmm. It's in there somewhere. Um, but, but in one of the non-stable channels, right? So you can opt into that if you would like, and you'll get new features on a biweekly basis going forward. Awesome. And then uh, hot off their success with the DMA, um, the yeah. European Parliament, right, is moving toward what they're calling the Artificial Intelligence Act. And this is the, uh, not surprisingly, they would lead the way on this, given how they're doing things with other forms of regulation, especially big tech. But the idea here is to put safeguards on uh, AI and just kind of legislate that, right? Um, it still needs to be fully adopted, uh, and it's not, but they're they're pushing toward it. So... You know, if you uh, if you like the GDPR and you thought the DMA was great, <laughs> this is their uh, this will be their iPod moment or something. I don't know what I'm talking about, but anyway, they're uh, they're moving toward that kind of uh, it's all over the map today. Um, they're moving toward that, so I'm sure we will never have anything like it in the United States because we can't get anything done. But uh, it looks like they're going to get there. Yeah, it's interesting you think about legislative bodies that legislate. Legislative bodies that legislate. What an idea! What a concept. Yeah, it's almost like uh, I have a default browser. You actually let me use it. It's a, it's, it's quite a concept. What is this Shangri La we're talking about? <laughs> now, uh, <laughs> did did I um, did, was it was it on purpose that you skipped the first topic in AI? Or did did I, I no, I'm that? sorry, I completely skipped that by okay. mistake. No, it's because I'm a spaz. So, uh, yes. Yeah, so this past week, Microsoft, micro, well, let's just say uh, back in. January, I think it was, Microsoft talked about this notion of bringing a custom GPT builder to uh, Copilot for Microsoft 365. And I think at the, I think they said at the time also to Copilot Pro. Um, it is available now and with for Copilot Pro subscribers like myself. And so uh, yesterday I flew home from Mexico City and had sporadic Wi-Fi. So naturally I built a Copilot bot. Um, as you do. In the air, as one would. And... Um, I was working on it again today because it, it it's not quite what I want, but ideally what I would be able to do is say, Hey, uh, I have this website that has a bunch of content on it and I'm going to ask you questions, but I only want you to look at my site. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Don't look anywhere else. And I can't get it to do that. But what's interesting is I can throw it questions like I would a, to co-pilot. And, and I, sus I have actually, I haven't tried this. I suspect this will work fine. Let it answer the question and say, yeah, but, I only want the answer to come from my site. And then it will say, okay. And then it, it gives you the answer just from my site, right? That works today. You can do that right now. Uh, or I, I can do it anyway with this thing. 
but to make it work that way all the time, I can't figure that out. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know why. There, there are these two very broad option checkboxes in there. One is uh, use search results and the other one is image generation. If I turn off web results, it doesn't do anything. Like I can't even look at my website. So it's not like that would make it, you know, I very specifically uh, designed it for lack of a better term. That's a stupid way to put it because I didn't do much work, but to only take information from Therat.com, but it, I, it does not do that. It, it says it's going to do that. I, mm. I just did another version today. And it very explicitly says this will only provide information from Theratacom. Then you ask it a question. It's like Wikipedia, The Verge, you know, whatever Reuters. Um, it 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 just doesn't work that way. Well, that's so annoying. Mm. Yeah, but uh, obviously that's not really what this kind of thing is for. It, a couple of weeks ago, Microsoft added these uh, custom GPTs, which we've seen in OpenAI as well, mm -hmm. um, for things like uh, well, image creation, which we already had, but uh, vacation planning. Uh, recipes and uh, I think fitness training, right? Or uh, yeah, fitness training. And th these, those are good ideas. Uh, those are good subsets, right? You kind of cut down on the volume of information and maybe it becomes more reliable and accurate. Mm -hmm. Although <laughs> careful with the recipes and fitness training, if they screw those up, because you could kill yourself. But um, <laughs> so I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think what I've really created here and again, created is a tough term because I didn't really create much, but I, I basically just sort of said to this thing, look, I, I want to focus on personal technology topics and it's, I don't know. I, it, I don't know that I've, I don't even know that this is a skin off the onion. It may be no different than just asking copilot the question. I, I haven't had time to test it. Um, but an interesting you, capability. You think this would be the thing it could do, right? Is index a site. That seems yeah. to be the logical thing to do. So Microsoft does have a uh, graphical interface. I'm forgetting the name of it. But there is a sec there is another tool Microsoft has for developers where they can create a tool using Copilot that mm -hmm. does exactly what I've just described, right? Mm -hmm. So that capability exists. Um, if you go into the interface for this custom GPT thing in Copilot, it says that you can upload your website to it. <laughs> And it's like, I'm not uploading my website. Here's a PDF version of the 18,000 right, articles I published since 2015. <laughs> Um, no. And, uh, but I, but there's something interesting here, right? I think between the capabilities that sort of exist today, not necessarily here, but elsewhere in the Microsoft stack, um, the stuff that we know is coming in Copilot for Microsoft 365, especially the OneDrive bit, right? Um, there will come a time and, it, and given the speed at which this is happening, probably before the end of the show, where I could create some kind of a custom GPT that's not just the content from my website, but I could point it at my OneDrive archive and mm -hmm. say, here's the 30 years of stuff I've written back when I worked at Windows IT Pro, back when mm -hmm. I wrote paper-based books across a variety of Microsoft topics, um, whatever it is. Here's the, no the notes I took during a meeting with someone from Microsoft. And then you could point it had all that stuff collectively and say, it's sort of like a, it's almost like a Paul Thrupp mind meld in a way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, uh, here's a, I want to know more about this topic, whatever it is, and have it actually go through that body of work, I think might be kind of interesting, you know? Um, and I'm going to, I'll play with that uh, because, you know, at that point, I guess I don't even have to show up every day, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, what might I think of this yeah, topic? Right. I don't know, based I on what you've written for 30 years. Exactly. Uh, you know, yeah. The challenge, you know, we'll see. the challenge here especially is that its ability to properly yeah. determine what it's going to say next required this whole set of training data that gave it yes. that ability. And then trying to take that and sort of separate it then from its index of content that you want to have it pay attention right. to um if leo was here he uh <laughs> would be talking about the um uh, probably effusively talking about the uh gpt that he created for yes. one of the programming languages Lisp. that he uses yes. um yeah. Lisp. yes well, we've heard of it yes and I, yeah i'm sure i'm sure <laughs> yeah. uh, i am a big yeah. nerd and i run yeah. some uh dungeons and dragons campaigns and i've actually created a couple of gpts that are custom to those campaigns and so if there's something that i need help with in the moment where the players do something completely unexpected yeah. i'll pop that in and then it has the context is, of what's happened thus far and i think that's really cool i really think this kind of thing is very interesting um i mean that 
that is literally the nerdiest example. I've ever <laughs> but no, but, but you, you create this world that has maybe a history and uh, famous people in it and characters and events and everything. And, uh, you know, if you were Tolkien writing this book, I don't know how he did things, but you know, I would have a hard time keeping the stuff in my brain and having a reference that you could go to, to find things out, I think is fascinating, right? I think that's a really neat thing. And, um, but, but whether it's a Dungeons and Dragons campaign or a, uh, a specific programming language or whatever it is, you're talking about something that has kind of a finite body of data. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the type of thing that AI would be good at uh, dealing with summarizing, providing answers against that data. Right. Um, and, and that, I mean, I'm, Kind of talking about the same thing again, not as geeky as your thing, but 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 um, you know, a finite body of data that you know for me in my case it has spanned like I said thirty years, but whatever number of articles, whatever number of books, whatever it is, like I mean, there's a you know kind of a there's a body of work there. Yeah. I mean, it's something to I'm I'm really curious to. It's like when you're a little kid and you hear your voice on a tape recorder for the first time and you say, "I sound like that," you That's know, awesome. yeah. like you, I. I I should know this information fairly intimately, but I think I'm going to be surprised by some of the stuff that comes out of it. Like, I'm just curious, you know, yeah. to see what that looks like. Absolutely. I think, it, yeah, that's yeah. That, that. So Google had, I can't remember what it was called, but something with the word notebook in it. And I was. Yeah, yeah I think it's, I think it is just Gemini. I think it's just a notebook in yeah, Gemini. Gemini notebook, yeah, Gemini yeah. notebook, yeah. And I wanted what you're talking about from that. I didn't end mm -hmm. up getting that. It just became kind of a search engine for <laughs> stuff that I'd written before. But yeah, I wanted, I mean, I've, I had, even going back to uh, high school documents in there from when I was in a poetry class, for example, and wrote a bunch of poetry. Right. And I thought it'd be super cool to see if it could pretend to be me writing a poem yes. and what that would end up right. looking. It, it didn't end up working. Well, that would be the next step. Now right. it's That's like, what I'd love to I, see. I was really busy this week. I didn't have time to work in the game. <laughs> What do you think I might write? Yeah. Uh, you know, that, like given the body that's of work that's come before, what is the next uh, uh, what would you I, know, what installment would I look here? like? Or, or um, oh, uh, Russia's back at it again, trying to get into the servers. How would I <laughs> yeah. uh, handle this problem? Right, right. How would I <laughs> respond to that? If, if I were Microsoft, I'm not saying I am, but if I was. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, well, yeah. So you, you said you, you, you kind of called it a search and I think you literally called it a search engine, right? Mm. Search engine's kind of an interesting term because I feel like we're going to start shifting on what that means. But um, sometimes you go to the web and you're looking for an answer to a question. This, and it's, it, it's a, it's, it's a fact, uh, the date of something, what day of the week was April 21st, uh, 1985 or whatever. Right? right. So those things are just, you know, whatever. It's like a little, you spit out a fact and that's kind of fun. But I think the summarizing bit is what's really interesting, right? Um, uh, look at everything I've ever written about, uh, OneDrive or something. And, and when did one, like, what was like, what happened with, remember OneDrive used to have before files on demand. I can't remember the name of it. There was this other thing. What was that called? You know, and, and to have it kind of go back and look through stuff and then say in, uh, April, 2020, you wrote this. And then in 2021, it was this, and then it changed this in 2022. I, just like that kind of, a. Uh, bullet list or not, yeah. or whatever, just like a summer. I think I still, I still think there's great value in that. I, I this is going to be very interesting. I, I, I think it's going to surface things that we, we're just fragile enough as humans. We kind of forget, or it's going to draw these kind of comparisons that we never connected ourselves. Yeah. I, I, the comparisons, especially, but also what you're saying there. Um, I remember reading a couple of books about memory and human beings. And uh, the argument made is that our brains were never designed to be these deep storage devices right. that our brains That's are right. very good at processing and very good at yep. in the moment. And so getting all of that stuff out of our brain and down somewhere even frees them up more to oh do God, the processing I, that they're good at. So that would be cool yeah. to have. How many times you walking down the street, you, you kind of catch something peripheral vision, you look and it's just, it's like, it, it, it triggers this. You're, I remember something now. Yeah. Or you smell something, or you know whatever Especially it is. Especially smell. Yep. And you're like, oh my god! Like I just had this. You know, or you see someone who's not the person, but it reminds you of somebody. And then you're suddenly, you know, yeah, those scenes I, I, are playing I think out AI now. is going to provide this uh, moment for us, you know, if you will, I mean, as we search our little collective histories here. Yeah. Very uh, cool.
Maybe. <laughs> Who knows? I don't know. Maybe. I, don't know. Uh, I couldn't even make the stupid GPT. What am I talking about? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Let's take a pause here. <laughs> Before we come back yeah. with a conversation about Microsoft 365, up next on Windows Weekly. All righty, Paul and Richard Campbell. Yeah. What do you got for us in Microsoft 365 land? So at the beginning of the show, I expressed for the 117th time my <laughs> angst with uh, Windows and, and what's going on there. But if you were to look at the collective body of people using Microsoft products, they I don't think there's an angsty angst bigger than the angst around Outlook mm. <laughs> right now. Um, there was a little bit of angst around Teams there for a while. I think that's kind of settled down. Um, but Microsoft uh, in 19, yeah, 1997, right, introduced Outlook, the first version. It came up out of Schedule Plus, which I think a lot of people either don't know or have never heard of or don't remember. But uh, basically, they added email, <laughs> I guess, to, to Schedule Plus and out came Outlook, right? And contacts, it, it, like those are sort of the big pieces. Yeah, and it was specifically designed for, uh, well, what became Exchange or what was, I guess, mm -hmm. by then Exchange, right? Yeah. Um, right at the time that internet email was happening, you know, and, yep. and a lot of the initial criticism of the product was that it wasn't very good at that stuff. So they spat out Outlook 98 a year later to kind of correct some of those mistakes. Um, and I don't know, remember when it happened, but Outlook 2000, Outlook 2003, whatever, Outlook became the center. Yeah, it's of, the sovereign app. The thing yeah, that it is, is the, trying to yep, be today. It's where you start your day at work. Mm -hmm. It's where you end your day at work. It's It was everything. How many people do we know that um, protected their PST file like it was the one ring from yeah. Tolkien? They had a yeah, yeah. backup of it life. in their pocket and a floppy or something back in the day, whatever. Uh, all of your email data was in this one place. Um, of course, now it's you know it's all been, it's different now. But um, but Outlook is uh, it has persisted, yeah. you know. Um, and I'm sure in most businesses today, there's a big divide between the people who kind of live and die in Teams and the people who kind of live and die in Outlook. And yeah. Microsoft's you know doing that work to integrate it. Well, they're screwing it all up because <laughs> Microsoft That's has released and is now improving a new Outlook. Uh, the cunningly named Microsoft Outlook, <laughs> right? Mm. Which is one of, I don't know, 20 something apps or whatever services with the name Outlook in it. Yeah. Um, that it will eventually, you know, replace the classic or the legacy or whatever they refer to it, the old, you know, the one that debuted in Office 97, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it ha it is in the process now of replacing the mail and calendar apps in Windows, yeah. which is causing a little bit of angst for some reason. Well, it was always a frustration that there were there was always another app, right? If you were in Outlook, and then you yeah. clicked on a calendar item, and it opened calendar. You know, right, that was annoying. Right. Yep. Yeah, and I, I, I don't know. I mm. those apps came up out of the Windows Eight stuff. This was the uh, it, it, going back. You go back to probably 2010, 2011. Mm. Chris Jones uh, out of Windows was releasing Windows Live at the time, and they were part of that initial wave of apps that were written in HTML. Yeah. Um, and we're supposed to show off the, um, uh, what was capable or what you could do with the, what was then called the Metro app platform, right? This mm -hmm. mobile app platform from Windows 8. So I, those apps to me are horribly out of date. There's all kinds of, well, the mail app, especially calendar's fine, honestly, but, um, but they're being replaced, right? So that's happening. Like that's happening pretty aggressively. Mm -hmm. But over on the commercial side, you get those guys running, you know, the classic legacy. The regional office. Probably. Yeah. They are not happy. <laughs> they are not happy because well, uh, they look at this thing and they see a couple of things. They see a web app, which they don't like. Right. Mm -hmm. And they see a lot of missing features, which is, you know, absolutely yeah. understandable. And just as is true of Office broadly or any Office app, there's a million features, a million commands in Microsoft Outlook today. Every one of those people re requires whatever subset of them. All of those subsets are completely different. So yep. pleasing every one of these users is not just difficult, it's impossible, right? Mm -hmm. um, no matter when this thing completes, it will not meet everyone's need. There is no doubt about it. Uh, but they're trying, you know. The the question to date has been, okay, but when is this happening? And most yeah. people are asking that question not because they care, but because they're looking at the clock saying, well, I'm going to retire in 2025. Could you yeah, do I really have to learn this? Yeah, yeah could I just get, you know, could I just never have to deal with this? Mm -hmm. So 
this past week, they finally provided the Microsoft uh, a bit of clarity in the what the schedule will look like. It's not specific uh, other than at the very earliest, they will replace classic Outlook for Windows with this new version in 2029. So that's right. over five years away, the end of 2029. That's that's the soonest this could happen. They have milestones to hit where they have to have some specific range of features before they'll even attempt to do this. Yeah. But there will be a point where, you know, the new Outlook will become the default in Office. It'll be the Outlook, as, yeah. Right. You'll still be able to go back, right? And there'll be a time where it will be the default and you can't go back. And that's mm -hmm. many years down the road, but it's, it will happen. The promise from Microsoft is that none of these milestones will be hit without at least a year of warning, right? In other words, they're not gonna, you're not going to wake up tomorrow and, and, and hear, oh, sorry, the opt-out's over. You can't do it. You know, like, um, you'll, you'll know a year. Mm -hmm. um, so commercial customers will have the ability to um, roll this out. And, they, and if they want to go early, like if for some reason the new Outlook works well in an organization, I've never heard of anyone say that. But if it does, uh, you'll be able to roll this thing out and make it the default and make it, you know, just there. Like you can not, you know, even prevent people from going back if you want which I'm sure Microsoft would like to see. But um, this is fascinating because in, in some ways, this is the uh, Teamsification of Outlook in a way. And what I mean by that is Teams is a web app, right? It's written, written with, well, it's written with web technologies, right? Um, Outlook is very much a classic, you know, Win32 app. The, the big architecture, well, it's not architecture, but the big kind of technical change that's occurred in classic Outlook, as we call it now, is that they uh, move the extensions, like the 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 way that you um, extend the ability of the app with, by third parties or whatever, uh, to a web model, right? And the idea there was that you could write one Outlook extension that would work in Outlook on the web, it would work in the classic client on the desktop, it would work in the new Mac client. Um, and, you know, not a bad approach, but I think, you know, they've seen the writing on the wall here and they want to, um, you know, move to a, a pure web client, which, I, you know, there's been a lot of pushback to this. So mm -hmm. if you're in this yeah. uh, group, um, that's your time frame, 2029 20, at mm -hmm. the earliest before that's, you. That's me. I'm in that group. Yep. I've tried to flip to the new one a couple of times. And then yeah, when I actually, I, I think I have to switch back to the old one to get any work done. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. I heard from what, uh, there, look, every, um, like I said, everyone has different needs, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you could point, you could probably point to specific features. Uh, fair enough. Uh, PT, PST file support, we joked about um, POP3 <laughs> account mm -hmm. support. Um, just support for like file yeah. types like EML and MSG, right? Mm -hmm. Older reordering, drag and drop, blah, 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 whatever. But one guy on Twitter, I don't mean, I'm not making fun of him exactly, but he said, I I have nine email accounts I have to manage. I, this thing only supports six accounts. And it's like, maybe you're the problem. Mm, you know, yeah. I, I don't know. I, <laughs> like nine accounts, what are you doing? Um, I don't know. Anyway, I... They're trying to be reasonable here. They're trying to be as um, transparent as they can be. I, I, the truth is they really don't know, right? <laughs> you yeah. know? No, no, um, they'll extend it as necessary, but they are so. just trying to get a motion yep. towards the sun setting. I, Running, maintaining, I don't envy them maintaining two no, apps, right? They like will never please anybody with this no. app. That's the problem. But they're trying to make the fewest people angry. So they create yeah. an arc to reduce those numbers. That sounds like that sounds like a perfect way to make bad choices mm -hmm. to try and make the fewest people yeah. angry. That's like mm -hmm. uh, designed by what is it called? Designed by committee. Committee, mm -hmm. basically. Or, yeah. Um, I. Yeah. yeah. Like, let's not innovate. Let's just try not to hurt. Mm -hmm. You know, I. I this is uh, the the Outlook group is the one that you know the people who live in Outlook and love Outlook mm -hmm. and rely on Outlook. Um, you know, they're the ones who would resist or were resisting teams in the beginning and probably still today and to a large degree. Mm -hmm. They're not going to move to new Outlook. <laughs> you know, like the, the the way you reduce the number of people literally is you let them retire. Yeah. <laughs> like they're, you know, they're just not going to move. And, and hence the dates, right? They're making it long yeah. enough to try and do that. And they right. have been peeling people off into uh, into teams. Loop, some of Loop's capabilities yes. are about allowing email people to participate into right. the collaborative tools as well. Yep. But they really have built a lot of bridges. I, I would say there's a more, you know, one of the issues here is that as soon as you're running in the browser context, your relationship with the network is different. Yep. Outlook has always had a problem with Windows networking because it's right. just the way that Windows networking works. 
will, if the network is grumpy about something, Outlook has no choice. It ends up hanging. It was very, they've never been able to crack that nut. You are describing a problem that is 20 years old. Exactly. Uh, they've you're, never I mean, cracked incredible. it. incredible. Yeah. And, they, yep. and their solution was not to crack it. It was to change the stack. To simply yeah. go, okay, let's just do this as a progressive web app instead. Because then yep. the browser owns that relationship instead of them. And I, I, you could, well, this, obviously there'll be some kind of client sync or whatever, but I, maybe it, uh, it being in the cloud <laughs> kind of some weird way reduces the hops to the client. Yeah. You know, it, it, there once was a time of, when Outlook behaved dramatically better if you had your own exchange server. Yeah. That wasn't, right. that hasn't been true for years either. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, they're yeah. trying. I, mean, but I would say this. The, the only thing worse than Outlook is all of the other email choices. <laughs> Can I get a shout out for you, Dora, anybody? Mm. Uh, <laughs> you know, you remember that one? But it's also, you know, part of it is your own behavior. Like lots of folks switch to Gmail because they just don't organize their mail. It's not a thing. They're not hierarchical about mail. That's an obsolete concept. You live in search. That's right. right. That's which exactly really, right. Which means, and I deal with folks like this all the time, which means what they really is, is I can't find your email. Send it to me again. I think Gmail search works pretty well, but I hear I, you. I, it, I it's do. A, it's just that in my experience, those that yeah. rely on that often just send me your email again because I can't find it. Right, right, right. I mean, if you want to round robin a Word doc, I think Outlook is still a great solution. Um I don't recommend doing that. But, no, uh, and, it, and these days, if you're running an M365 properly, M365 intercepts, that throws it into SharePoint and just yes. passes a link around. That's right. And it looks is, like you're doing that thing you thought you were doing. But yeah, yeah but it yeah. but it actually is maintaining versioning and so forth for yeah, you. Not to fly. mention it, just permissions and stuff, right? You're, yeah. you're, you're making sure it doesn't go outside the environment if that's what you want or your organization or whatever. Um, and when that works, it is magic. And when right. it doesn't work, the error messages are hopeless and you will <laughs> never figure out why it isn't working. I think you just described what at the top of the show, the modal dialogue box That's that it. is just like yeah. seriously. like What? I, what? Why? Yeah. You know, and you know, the funny thing is that wouldn't happen in the new Outlook because it can't happen in the new Outlook because PWA. <laughs> oh, because the, uh, you can't do a modal dialogue. Not allowed to do a dialogue. Extension. That's not a thing. Right, right. Modern, uh, yeah, nice. Yeah. Okay. I don't, I, I have not used Outlook, a uh, classic Outlook in a long time, uh, other than those uh, mistaken clicks where it, it starts opening. You're like, oh, what have I done? You know, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> you know, yeah, my mistake. Yeah, you, you get a little chill as that thing pops yep. up again. And you're yep. like, oh no, I got to make this go away. <laughs> and you click on it too quickly and now it's got the white screen of death. Literally, and it will never go away until you house, and You're like, oh, here we go. Yeah, here you go. <laughs> you know, I think yeah. the line I used on .NET Rocks, it actually got me a call from the Outlook team, was 65 threads, none of them are for you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Listen, I it, this was like dealing with a slightly feral animal. You just kind of, you set the thing up to download your mail, you walk away, come back tomorrow and see how it's done, you know? Yeah. Like, let me know when you're done doing whatever you want to do, because exactly. clearly what I want to do He'll is get not tired important. eventually. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Well, I mean, every time you're angry with Windows is because it's prioritized something over what you need. That's a good right? point. Yeah. You there know, you go. I, yeah. You know, that whole I start your app and it immediately wants to update. It's like, you know, mm -hmm. I was starting this app because I had something to do. Right. Not right. What you want to do. I um I, this is my relationship with Discord. I use Discord specifically for the show. Mm -hmm. I don't use it outside of the show. Um, and every time I run it before the show, it has to, it installs it. Yes. Yeah. And I've just learned <laughs> like, that an, an hour before the show, start discord and yep. let it twitch for a while. Yeah, and exactly. then we'll be able to use it. Pardon the pun. Um, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, get it. I get it. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a little slow here today. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, slightly related to, <laughs> I can't believe you're talking about this. I'm delighted. Skype. Yeah. Really? <laughs> All right, so Who? I, I got a lot of... Nobody knows, even knows what it is anymore. Thank you. I was going to say, so listen, we live in a... You think I'm cynical. You should see my Twitter feed, right? So <laughs> uh, a story about Skype goes out on the chat, on the wire there, and it's like, oh, Skype still exists? I, I didn't know. Uh, you know, come on. Um, I, I I use Skype every single day. I mean... You really? I, That's amazing. I can't, I'm not proud of that fact. I'm just saying, <laughs> you know, it's it's still a, a thing. and it, And it's kind of strange because Skype is a place where... 
uh, things show up, new features, right? They added that uh, after Copilot went to Bing initially, it mm -hmm. showed up in Skype. You know, yep. maybe they feel like it's a safe space to test things or something. I don't um, know. Skype well, today. So, sorry. The underlying DLL for Skype is the same one for Teams. The 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 mo the uh, the voice modules, all of the communication stuff. It's literally the same piece of code. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I honestly is. This kind of client goes, it's not a bad one. No. Here's an interesting, here's a little tip. This could have been my tip this week. It should have been, but uh, you can, you, you could Skype yourself, right? Yep. You can, and, the, yeah, and then go your Skype yourself sounds like a horrible thing to say to somebody. <laughs> but the idea there is we do this with email, right? We yep. send ourselves an email and then we go to the other device and get our email, right? You can do that with Skype. You Skype, you could send files and whatever, go, you know. Yeah. Skype yourself. If I this if is, I had set up a little earlier today, I would have fired up Skype to make a call to, to myself with a recording to hear this microphone to figure out that go. I had and it backwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe. Maybe I would have figured it out. Maybe, know. yeah. <laughs> I, but, I don't know. Um, like talking into the back of the microphone is not one I don't I don't think I would have that would have been on my troubleshooting <laughs> checklist. Uh, yeah, it, but, it took me a it took me a minute, but we got there. I thought you were talking when you talked into the side of it, I was like, Oh my god, that sounds way better. Mm -hmm. Um, the, <laughs> maybe um you should do it maybe you should do the whole show sideways. The, like this. <laughs> you know. You know, as a 20 plus year podcaster, like once upon a time, we did this show through Skype. In fact, I would have oh, yes, multiple yes. laptops set up, each on separate Skype oh, accounts, yeah. all going into a mixed minus board wow. to be able to do track isolation. We used to, at Twit, we, did, we used Skype for yep. possibly a decade. I mean, mm -hmm. I, it was a long, long time. And Skype everybody Skype. had Skype. And then over time, bit by bit, it was like, hey, we're going to use Skype for this. And they're like, right. oh, yeah, I have a started that for a while. I was like, well, it's going to have to be updated. I guarantee you. So go get started. Go get it now. Exactly. I, I, <laughs> this is a goofy reference, but there's a show on Netflix called Somebody Feed Phil, right? This is mm -hmm. the guy who started the Everyone Loves Raymond show. He does a travel show now. But one of the little sticks they have in the show is that the last five minutes, he, he Skypes his parents and they talk about wherever he is. And it's really the worst part of the show, but it's like this little in-show ad for Skype. You know, and that's how you can tell he's a middle-aged white guy. He's using Skype. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but so Skype, uh, yeah, so yes, uh, to answer your question, Skype still exists. Uh, yes, they're still updating it. And, uh, and, and it's weird because I noticed this before I saw the announcement. But if you go into Skype, and yeah, you probably have it. There's like a, there's some tabs now and you can tab between uh, chats, channels and all, which is both chats and channels together. And uh, you can channels it's like a it's a feed you can add news to it you can add uh news sources you know cnn is in there washington post etc cetera, etc cetera. and why anyone would use this apps like this this app like this i don't know uh, but it's the social mediafication of skype is that where we are oof, and right and right on schedule now mm -hmm. that facebook mm -hmm. is finally becoming a big thing they decided to jump on that bandwagon so i don't know i don't i really i can't explain why they're doing this Mm. Maybe Skype is another example of a product that, uh, you know, just leave it alone. So it's been, a, it's <laughs> you know, just, just been unsupervised for a while and some interns got bored. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see what, if we, we could just release an update, right? Like yeah. no one would notice. What would happen <laughs> you know? if. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's how these things are. Right. Right. We've had one too many tequilas. What do you, mm. do you let's go back to the office. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, so I, I don't, I can't, that I cannot explain. I'm amazed. I, yeah. It's crazy. Um, Parallels desktop, if you're a Mac user, you know, that is kind of the, the especially on the Apple Silicon Maps, uh, Macs, the great way to run, run Windows. If you are a Windows on ARM fan, you know, it's right now still the best way to run Windows and ARM, which is silly and sad and embarrassing, but a fact. Um, so this product's pretty great. Um, the version 19 came out, I think every year, the, uh, August or September, I think is the time frame. And they've released the third major update now for that. And there's a couple of Windows related things that I think are interesting. Um, one is that it fixes some graphic rendering issues with uh, it. It doesn't support DirectX 12, which is too bad, but pre DirectX 12 games, um, including some big ones like Genshin, uh, Genshin? Genshin Impact, Genshin, yeah. Impact, Genshin Impact, Rise of Kingdom, Dark Souls 2, et cetera. Um, the other one for uh, corporate customers, especially, but they've always supported cross platform clipboard. Uh, synchronization, right? Copy to the clipboard in Windows, paste into a Mac app, right? Kind of seamless back and forth. I guess the corporate customers asked for them to add some directionality to that so you can configure it at a corporate level for uh, keeping it Mac to Windows only, Windows to Mac only, or bi-directional or off, right? Obviously. 
Uh, and then there's some other features related to Linux, which we'll ignore uh, because, you know, <laughs> Linux. Uh, <laughs> no, I did a big thing about Linux last week. I like Linux. Relax. <laughs> Chill, everybody. <laughs> Calm down. I like Linux. Mm. Awesome. Um, I bought a penguin hat at Build, right? Uh, you know, Mary Jo <laughs> and I, and I think uh, some others we all had, Raphael probably, we had our Linux hat, our penguin hats on, remember? Mm -hmm. Linus, the, the, wait, what? No, wait, what's the actual name, name of the penguin? Tux. Tux. Tux, that's yeah. right. Um, Tux. I think it's time for Xbox Corner, yeah? I think so, too. What? Uh, just a couple of small things this week. Um, there is a group of Activision uh, quality assurance workers, uh, mostly, I think, in, oh boy, I already forgot, Wisconsin or Minnesota or somewhere up there. Uh, but spread out uh, through a few different locations. It is Minnesota, excuse me. Smaller groups in Texas and California uh, voted to unionize. They went through a place called the Communications Workers of America, who announced this and said, this is now the biggest video game union in the United States. Uh, approximately 400 people uh, mm. across the various groups. Um, there are some other groups in Microsoft Studios from like Blizzard, Raven, I think ZeniMax, who have also unionized uh, smaller groups than this. Um, Microsoft, uh, not so much as a condition of its uh, acquisition of Activision Blizzard, although, but they did make this pledge that they would remain neutral on uh, unions, and uh, they've come through on that promise and said, you know, we we said we would be and we are, and uh, we'll, we recognize this union as the bargaining representative for these workers, and uh, we will maintain a positive uh, labor slash management relationship. I mean, so. Um, there you go. I mean, the the video game industry needs to rehabilitate its image of how it treats its workers. Full yeah. stop. Yeah. And, and you know what? Uh, through I unions would also and fine. The corollary to that is that what TikTok needs is Bobby Kotick. So, uh, you know, we can get no. we get rid of him from Activision. He could go to TikTok. Perfect. You know, the world is uh, is in balance again. Yes. Well, while well, various. Because I was hoping to hear from that guy again. Yeah. Various legislative <laughs> bodies just, are banning TikTok. Take the money okay. and go to paradise. Can you just yeah, leave? What are you doing? Just don't, you, just, yeah. just, just, don't you have enough? Aren't you I know. done? Just go. Go. Why do you have to be doing stuff? Um, well, evil is as evil does, I guess. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> evil is a box of chocolates. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's All right. Yeah, so um, <laughs> it's a I'll just keep going. Uh, <laughs> and then also, speaking of the Activision Blizzard, uh, acquisition and some of the conditions that Microsoft uh, kind of established or agreements. Um, they, one of the many uh, services that they talked about bringing their games to was Boosteroid, which I've described as Bless a you. company we never would have heard of <laughs> otherwise. Boosteroid? What a uh, Boosteroid. stupid name. Uh, Sorry. That's yep. mean. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a cloud streaming game service, right? They signed a 10 year deal to bring uh, various games to this platform. Um, sometime, God, it was last year they brought, I know it was Gears of War, Deathloop, and some other games uh, to the platform. Now they're, they, they're bringing more games, I guess. So uh, what is the list? Yeah, Deathloop, Dishonored, Dishonored 2. Um, <laughs> the Dishonored games are funny. Uh, uh, Gears 5, Gears Tactics, Ghostwire Tokyo, and Pentiment. Um, they work with crossplay and cross save, right? Which is a big, uh, one of the, or some of the big features of the Xbox platform. Uh, it's this is sort of Europe or maybe even the UK's version of like NVIDIA GeForce Now, like that kind of service. Um, I think it's I think it might be French actually, it's somewhere, it's somewhere in Europe, anyway. Um, uh, yep, yeah, thank you, EU, uh, for making them do that. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> there's and there's a bunch of others. Remember, they they had Rams both with NVIDIA for GeForce Now, but also uh, NWare was one and some others. So, there'll be more of this, but. Uh, just the confusing array of ways in which you can play Microsoft Studio games is expanding. I just boost. I it sounds like a booster, right? terrible uh, sports beverage. I can't sit down. I have boosteroids. That, I, yeah. There's all or kinds that. of things that go through my mind. <laughs> um, I, I, why are you so jumpy? I... Ask your doctor about Boosteroid. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Boosteroids EX. When uh, Boosteroids is not enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Up next, it's time for the back of the book here on Windows Weekly, uh, hosted this week by me, Micah Sargent, as uh, our normal host. Leo Laporte is on a beach somewhere getting a tan.
in theory. Cabo San Lucas, I think. Yeah. Yes. Uh, all right. Let's hear about the tip of the week. I do want to stress it is a coincidence that Richard and I left Mexico exactly yeah. as when Leo. Leo showed up. It's just a weird coincidence. <laughs> I, have you ever seen have you ever seen all three of them in the same room at the same time? Exactly. Exactly. No. Interesting. I don't think so. I don't nope. think so. Okay. Either, no. I don't think I have. Well, right. I mean, th there was the one, the one build where I fed you all cast strength whiskey and annoyed the crew. Oh, that's yes. That oh, my that, first that is literally experience. a decade yes. ago. Oh, see, but it's interesting. I don't remember that. Mm. Uh, <laughs> Did you say you fed them boosteroid? That's uh, <laughs> yeah. oh, dangerous. Yeah, said, Listen, I don't know what the kids are telling you. Uh, <laughs> boosteroid's where it's at. Yeah. Um, I got the money if you got the booster right. <laughs> no, I had, this, I, I had a Abelor Abunda for the first time, and yes. I described it as like being shot in the tongue. I do it sounds that. delightful. I remember Leo trying to take it like Gollum, like yes, uh, taking my one ring. And, <laughs> and running off with it, hiding yep. in his office. Yep. That was a good day. Like being shot in the tongue. I'm told. Uh, <laughs> okay, so let's talk for a few minutes about Kev Brewer. Uh, Kev is in the... Discord, uh, he's a frequent contributor. I see him online elsewhere as well. And uh, today he showed up on my website with a really good tip. And uh, I'm embarrassed to say I did not know about this, but this is a neat one. If you bring up the uh, clock app in Windows, there is a world clock function and you can add cities to it. And if you add cities to it, there's a little toolbar in the bottom there floating in the bottom. And one of the buttons is compare. And what it, what it will do, among other things, is, well, it will, what it will literally do is compare the times of those two places. So, for example, I was just in Mexico City, and Mexico last year stopped observing daylight savings time. So, part of the year, there's a one-year time difference, but part of the year, there's a two-hour two time difference. And normally, these things are not that hard to figure out. We're not talking about, you know, algebra here, but... You know, some places do daylight savings at different times. Some places in the United States still don't do daylight savings, right? Um, it's kind of a neat thing. And so I can see, for example, right now the local time is whatever it is. And the local time in Mexico City is whatever it is. And it tells me those differences. And I this is like a neat little feature. They've I have no idea when this came. A lot of the stuff that happens in the clock app lately has been related to focus sessions, right? Which is a part of that focus um uh, uh, feature and do not stir, but we have in Windows 11, but I don't, world clock, I I don't know when this happened. It's cool. And plus it's well, a cool map of the earth. I, I had to take this out for a spin. So I hit the Windows key and typed in clock and then yeah, a box popped update. up to say, yeah, updating clock. I'm like, really? Oh, yeah. So <laughs> really? what you're saying, right. So if you've never run the clock app, you will see that every single time you run the clock. Mm -hmm. right? And most people haven't, but um, I, I run it because I use focus sessions. I've seen, I, but I, yeah, every new windows install or a windows install in which you have never used the app uh, every single time. Yep. Yeah. Uh, anyway, that's a cool one. Thank you, Kev, for that. Um, I, like I said, did not know this. Um, sometime last month or so, uh, we learned that uh, Lamasoft, the Jeff Mintner story, was arriving on March 13th. If you look at your calendar, today is March 13th. This game is now available. This is one of those interactive doctor uh, documentaries. Sorry. Um, this is a guy who wrote uh, m and created many, many different games across many platforms. This one has 42 different games that span his career from the Sinclair X81 to the Commodore, VIX-20 and 64, the Atari 8-bit systems, ST, Jaguar, et cetera. There's a lot of stuff in there. Um, there's some kind of mainstream games like the ZX-81 version of Centipede, which is pretty cool. But the classics to me for this guy are Attack of the Mutant Camels, uh, Revenge of the Mutant Camels, and then Grid Runner, which is a 64 game. And there's a they're calling it a reimagined version of Grid Runner. That's It is accurate to the Commodore 64 game but hmm. with modern graphics and sound. And it's based, I think it's basically using an emulator, but they've just changed the like the, the presentation, if you will, right? Um, it's available across platforms. Um, this is the second one. Remember, the first one was about uh, Karateka and uh, that guy, the guy who wrote that game. And um, there's going to be a bunch more of these, apparently. So this is from uh, Digital Eclipse, which is now owned by Atari, but you can get this across PC, multiple areas, Xbox, PlayStation, and Nintendo Switch. Very, very cool. Fantastic. And then just a kind of a side app pick, because I think it was last week I mentioned uh, any text. Does that sound right? Any text? I think it was. 
Very, very complicated app. Um, what I'm looking for here is an offline capable version of Notion, essentially. Mm -hmm. Although, by the way, I used Notion on the plane ride home and it was okay. Like the couple of notebooks or whatever I hit came up. I, I've not always had that experience, but that was okay. Um, a bunch of people pointed me to something called Joplin. Mm -hmm. And uh, Joplin, you know, like a lot of things looks just like Notion. There's a lot of the stuff, you know, Microsoft Loop is a good example. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, among the things you can do with this is you can have it sync through a cloud service. It's, or uh, I think it does OneDrive and probably Dropbox, or just put it into the file system. And if that file system is synced through a system like OneDrive or a Google Drive, which is what I'm using, it just syncs, right? So I put this on multiple PCs. It syncs up. It seems to work great. It is Markdown based, which I love. Like I really mm. like Markdown. And uh, so that's kind of a neat thing. It, it, it might, that might be slightly off-putting to some people. But you can do like that uh, uh, Markdown side-by-side -side view or uh, just have the rich editor, uh, which seems to work pretty, pretty good. So it's uh, something to look at. Uh, again, like so, sort of like the, uh, I've been talking through this for a couple of weeks, but this is a much simpler app and is probably a better solution for more people um, than that complicated thing I was talking about last time, hmm. which I, I have to say, I never figured out. It was, it's very difficult to use. Interesting. So many softwares. I know. It's, this, this is the biggest thing. There are so many things that look like Notion. It is, yeah. it's a whole sub market. I, I don't understand yeah. why, but it is. No, alternative to Notion, and there. Yeah, no, it's crazy. It's crazy how many there are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I always question what Notion's copying, right? Yeah, Leo's probably used them all. I remember him talking about Joplin yeah. before. I feel as like well. I've used them all too. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, but I, Bizarre. yeah, there there are a few that are just so bare bones that I I'm like. No, I don't. But uh, I remember Joplin being pretty good. Yeah, Joplin. This one seemed uh, this one is pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. That's it. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Tell us about Run as Radio this week. Oh, this week's show, episode nine twenty three. If you're keeping track, I'm starting to think about what to do for episode one thousand. Yeah. Uh, I'm talking to Doctor Doctor Jody Burchill. So I've uh, chatted with her before, not on this show, but on Donna Rocks. Um, she was doing AI before it was cool. She's actually a professional, you know, like has the real degree. It does the real work. So, and it's a very sensible approach to explaining these things. So I thought it was a good chance to sit down with someone who, who's known it backwards and forwards from the early days of GPT and say, all right, what are we doing here? What is this software and what does it really mean? And she just took us on a ride to just explain each piece and how it works together. And, and then, you know, that makes it very clear of what it's going to be good at, what it's not going to be good, useful for. Uh, and, and, you know, not, she's not against it by any stretch of imagination. It's just a tool, but if you use the tool appropriately, you should get good results. Awesome. Yeah, definitely check that out. And as you mentioned, mm -hmm. you have been podcasting for ages at this point 923 mm -hmm. is the mm -hmm. uh, episode number for run as yeah every wednesday since april 11th 2007 wow it's awesome incredible. all right then that means it's time for the brown liquor pick mm. of the week. well uh since i happen to be in redmond at an event i receive booze as part of my life <laughs> Kind of an unavoidable thing. Uh, a friend of mine gave me a bottle of Bushmills 21, which I should have brought with me, but I forgot it. It's sitting in the hotel room. Sorry. <laughs> uh, and I never talked about Bushmills before, except uh, adjacently in our conversations about Irish whiskey, that original Irish whiskey conversation we talked about. I ended with the Red Breast 12, which is one of my very, very favorites. Um, arguably, Bushmills is the, law, the oldest distillery on the planet. Uh, there are evidences of distilling going on there starting in 1608. Now, it's in the area today was known as Northern Ireland, but in 1608, that was not a thing. They predate all of that. And so not far from Belfast. Um, they got the Bushmill name in 1784, and that is a derivative of the barley mills that they had and the Bush River, which is where they get the water to make their whiskey. Um, how famous is Bushmills? It is referenced by James Joyce in his epic Ulysses. Uh, and apparently he was a fan. So th this is old school whiskey, like in the ultimate degree. And in 2008, on the 400th anniversary, the Bank of Ireland printed banknotes with the Bushmills distillery on it. 
God bless they, the Irish. That is amazing. It is badass. 400 years, right? And then much longer. It's longer now. It's been you know, four, 400 and something. Love it. Uh, they make a lot of different whiskey. Uh, they, for whatever you prefer, they make a blend. You know, this is still the Irish process. And if the rules for Irish are a little bit different than the rules for Scottish whiskey, obviously it needs to be made in Ireland, although they recognize both Northern Ireland, which is part of the UK, and the Republic of Ireland as being Ireland. They don't require only barley. In fact, my, many Irish whiskeys are made with a blend of grains, different malted cereals. So you, sometimes you see rye, sometimes you see wheat, sometimes you see corn. They kind of go any way, which way they want. They are not concerned about using strictly malting for the enzymes. You can do sacrification, which is the in, introductions of diastase and other enzymes to allow the malts, to the, the, the grains to turn to sugar. Uh, they use yeast fermentation. They do not require a specific number of distillations. Column stills are allowed as well as pot stills. Often Irish whiskey is triple distilled. They allow a maximum distillation level of 94.8%, which is very, very high for most product that you make, you'd be calling whiskey. That's in vodka territory. Um, and most people don't distill quite that high. Uh, they do allow for caramel color. They require a minimum of three years of barreling, and uh, you and you have to be forty percent above ABV to uh, to be declared a whiskey. Uh, they do define different categories of whiskey in the Scottish in the Irish world. And Scottish is really you know just the single malts and the blends, but in the Irish they have single pot still, single malt, and single grain as well as blending as particular kinds. And of course, if there's an age statement on the bottle, that's the youngest thing that's in the bottle. For this particular version of Bushmills, and it would, I would call it its premier product, the 21 is about as high as you're going to go from Bushmills. And it's 100% malted Irish barley, as opposed to some other Bushmills that do do blends of grains. They do a triple distillation, pot still only. And then, of course, because it's all barley, they need to manage the sulfurs, which is why they use copper pot stills, because the copper chelates the sulfur out of the, the distillate, makes it a little milder. They do come off at the third distillation at a fairly high alcohol level. That exact number is not known, but they cut with water before going into the barrels. They they do a split barreling for 19 years in both Sherry Oloroso casks and American bourbon casks. Those are then what they call married together. You'd call them pouring into a pot. And then they do a finishing casking two years in Portuguese Madeira casks. So Madeira is an island actually off the coast of Africa, but controlled by Portugal. And it's where Madeira wine comes from. And they have a handful of these barrels. It's just not that much Madeira. And so to get a Madeira finish is a pretty rare product. And it is extraordinarily good and priced appropriately at 250 US dollars. Hmm. So I have a good friend, obviously, <laughs> although he he went to the distillery because he doesn't live far from there on his way to come here and pick up a bottle directly from the distillery, which is pretty cool. I Do I know of, this friend? This, this friend sounds familiar. They, you could probably I'm not going to name him, but you probably could figure out who he is. Okay. Can I name him? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, go ahead, I'm sorry. It's, it's Bushmill. Obviously. It's Bushmills. It's, yeah. and, it's uh, Bob Bushmill. Yeah. I have in the past toured this distillery. It's beautiful and ancient. They do have a new still they do have a new distillery and the old distillery labeled accordingly. So you can kind of take a look at what they're doing there. But yeah, there's something about walking around on ground where yeah, they've been making spirits for four hundred years. That would be cool to say for sure. Absolutely. Well, folks, I do believe that brings us, if you can believe it, to the end of this episode of Windows Weekly. Uh, of course, you can head to twit.tv slash WW if you would like to get the show notes for this week's episode and every week before. Uh, the show records live every Wednesday, round about 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, 1800 UTC. Uh, you can find the audio and video versions of the show on that uh, page, twit.tv slash 
slash WW. You just simply click or tap to subscribe to audio or subscribe to video in your podcast player of choice. Uh, I will also mention that you can get ad free versions of all of our shows uh, by joining Club Twit at twit.tv slash club twit. When you join the club for $7 a month, $84 a year, you get access to some great stuff, as I mentioned, access to ad free versions of all of our shows because you, in effect, are supporting us. And so we uh, provide just the content to you. You also get access to the Twit Plus bonus feed that has extra content you won't find anywhere else. Behind the scenes, before the show, after the show, special club Twit events get published there. And access to the members-only Discord server. A fun place to go to chat with your fellow club Twit members and also those of us here at Twit. Uh, uh, as if that wasn't enough, we also give you premium access to some Club Twit exclusive shows. The audio versions of those shows are available to the public, but if you want to see the video versions of these shows, then you will need to subscribe to Club Twit. Those shows include Hands on Mac, which is a show from yours truly that covers uh Apple Tips and Tricks, Hands on Windows from Paul Therott that covers Windows Tips and Tricks, that untitled Linux show that Kevin was showing there, uh, all about Linux, and of course, Home Theater Geeks, the show from Scott Wilkinson that covers the home theater. Oh, and I should mention iOS Today as well is there. All of those shows available uh, in video versions when you join the club. $7 a month, $84 a year, and you help us keep doing what we do. Uh, you can also... As a member of Club Twit, come watch a recording of This Week in Tech in person uh, coming up in April. So you just head to tickets.twit.tv. Uh, you'll pop in your Club Twit email so we can uh, check that you are indeed a member of Club Twit. Uh, those signups are filling up fast. So if you have wanted to make your way to the studio and watch a show in person, you want to hop on that. All right. It is time to say goodbye uh, to our excellent hosts of the show, Richard Campbell. Uh, where can folks head to keep up with what you're doing? And uh, do you have anything else you want to pitch? Uh, the usual spot is run as radio. Um, but in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be doing another conference down in Vegas called The Fabric Show. So that's uh, Microsoft's new data analytics show. This is our first version of this community show. Uh, it looks like it's going to sell out. We're in uh, up over 3,000 attendees now. So we're pretty excited about it. But uh, if you use the code word run as when you register, you'll get a discount. Nice. There you go. Little little tip for you. And mm -hmm. Paul Therott of Therott.com. How about you, friend? I mean, I don't have anything new. <laughs> you could uh, look at my books at leadpub.com, the Windows 11 field guide, and Windows Everywhere. Um, but yeah, I mean, just follow I just, on well, Instagram. Any, That's how you can keep I'm up. Barely, with I'm barely awake. <laughs> just a food. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds good. Well, uh, I will be back next week for another episode of Windows Weekly. Leo will be back after that. Thank you all for tuning in to this week's episode. Thank you to all of you who hung out in the Discord with us today to chat. And we'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.